All right, I'll call our budget hearings to order since I have quorum and can we have roll call? Councilmember Brand. Councilmember Brandau. Here. Councilmember Capriolio. Councilmember Olivier. Councilmember Quintero. Councilmember Soria. Council President Baines. We can all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, salute. All right, today we're going to open up our budget hearings. We will the uh, the departments we will, that will be covered today will be a general fund, general fund overview by uh, Budget Management and Studies Division, the Office of the City Attorney, the Finance Department, and the tra Transportation Department, along with airports. So I think I turn it over to Jane. And Jane, it's my understanding you're going to give us a, kind of an overall, uh, an overview of, of how we're going to conduct our budget process this year. Uh, yes, um, actually. Uh, good morning, Council President and Council Members. Jane Sumter, Budget and Management Studies Division. Uh, this is the first day of Council review hearings, and uh, as Council President pointed out, we will start as, as we usually do with a general fund overview. That will be done by me, uh, and then the department reviews will follow. Uh, the first thing I would like to do before we get started, though, is to thank the members of my staff, um, Henry Fierro, Sharon McDowell, Pedro Rivera, Scott Matzenbacher, Alma Torres, and Elise Muniz. Um, as always, they have done a tremendous job under very challenging circumstances. I would also like to extend my thanks to all of the departmental staff that has also uh, assisted us in creating the document. The format for the hearings will be much as it has been in the years before. Um, as I said, I will present the, an overview of the department's budget. I will be hitting the highlights, as it were. If Council has any specific questions concerning the Department's operations, plans, et cetera, the Department Director and their staff will be here uh, to answer those questions. Um, at that time, the public will also be allowed to comment on that Department. If Council members wish to make motions concerning that Department, or in fact any Department, they can do so at any time during the hearing. The motion must get a second in order to be recorded by my staff and the City Clerk. We will keep track of these motions and we'll distribute the list after the budget hearings every day. Um, the motions uh, will be voted on June 16th. They need a simple majority to pass. And after the motions are voted on, my staff will reconcile the changes into the enabling documents such as the AAR, the PAR, um, and et cetera, and they will be voted on on June 19th. During this time, any requests for information or any directions will also be recorded by my staff, and the answer for those uh, requests for information will be sent through the city manager's office to all of the council members. Within 48 hours of approval by council, the city clerk will submit the past budget to the mayor for approval or veto, and within 10 days of the receipt, the mayor has to line item veto power and may request reconsideration of rejected items. So that is, by and large, the process, and it, uh, it's the process we've used over the last few years. And so if no one has any questions, we can get started. Let's get started. Let's get started. OK. The general fund overview um, and the general fund five-year forecast are located on pages A33 and A43 of your budget books. The general fund ongoing revenues for 16 total 288 million. This is 2.3% higher than FY15 amended and 1.6% higher than FY15 estimates. The primary cause of this increase is a steady increase in estimates for most revenues, particularly in sales and property taxes. Business license and franchise fees are also increasing. There has, however, been a decrease to some charges for services due to development revenues that are flattening out. Decreases, uh, there are also decreases in revenues from other departments due to a change in methodology and how we account for overhead reimbursements. Total resources are 297.7 million 
This includes the estimated carryover from the current fiscal year, FY15, which is estimated, as you can see, at about $9.2 million. Now, there are several factors that have uh, gone for this uh, building this carryover, primarily additional and, and property and sales taxes, business license, and room tax. These have been able to offset the lower charges for services that we're seeing in this current fiscal year, primarily in development and code. Also, lower than budgeted personnel costs. Attrition is taking place citywide, but primarily in the police department, and also lower operations and maintenance costs in most departments. Increases in revenues over the five-year period, which is again on page A43, vary from one to two and a half percent, with few exceptions due to some one-time events that we're aware of at this time. These are conservative projections. There are several unknowns with regards to revenue, primarily the health of the recovery, its strength, and the, and the effect on assessment values, which in turn affects property taxes, which is our largest single revenue source, the effects of the drought, which are still unknown, and the effect of internet sales to sales tax revenues, which is a small but growing part of the sales tax pie. The three largest categories of sales of, of uh, general fund revenues are property taxes, sales taxes, and charges for services. Together, they represent 76% of all general fund revenues. And I will briefly go over each one of those. The estimates for property tax for FY16 are 200, or, sorry, 112 million, including RDA increment. This is fully 38% of general fund revenues. This reflects a growth rate of 2.5% over FY15. Uh, I met with the assessor a couple of months ago, and he indicated to me that the largest single factor that will be driving the increases next year will be the reassessment of properties uh, that had been assessed downward during the recession. Uh, he is now uh, undergoing a program that will reassess those properties, and, and that will be impacting positively impacting our property tax number this next year. Just to note, though, that assessment values don't have a direct impact on the amount of property tax we get. That only affects the amount of the value of the property. That doesn't affect the, the individual actually paying the tax. The out-year estimates for property taxes are 25 to 2% over the next five years. I would point out just briefly, uh, just to remind the council, that property tax really isn't one number. We often think of it as just the real secured number, and that is by far the largest, but there are also other types of property tax that are not affected by the assessed value, like the unsecured tax, delinquent tax, supplemental roll, and the property tax override. So there are other elements within that large property tax category that you see on your schedule. Just for information, the secured gross assessed values from the county for FY15 for the city of Fresno are $28.6 billion. Fresno's adjusted gross levy for 15 is $85.7 million. That is an increase. One positive sign is that the, the, the delinquency rates um, for property tax payments have gone down over the last five years, from a high in 2008 of approximately 4.5% down to 1.5% for FY14. Sales tax estimates for 16 total about 82.2 million, which is about 5.7% higher. Sales tax is about 28% of all general fund revenues. The largest single categories within sales tax are general retail, transportation, and food products. These have been steady over the last few years, and in fact, they are some of the highest uh, ones in the state overall. They also lead several other uh, categories in several other counties and several other cities. Uh, according to the latest information we have, um, general retail and um, new auto sales are the largest single segments of economic growth for this last fourth quarter. Currently, there are two segments or two elements of sales tax that we have. One is the regular distribution of sales tax. The other is the triple flip, which is um, the mechanism that the state put in place back in 2004 to repay their economic recovery bonds. That triple flip is ending as of June of this year. However, the wind-up of that triple flip and the various 
permutations that the state has to go through will take it the better part of this next fiscal year. And so uh, we will not fully return to the 1% um, and get the 1% of sales tax until probably late this year and then for all of next year. And I will say the one reason that it's kind of important is the fact that when we get sales tax on a regular basis every single month, that does improve our cash flow. Because during the triple flip, we only got the triple flip during uh, uh, property tax payments in January and May. And this negatively impacted our cash flow. Once this ends and we go back to just getting sales tax every month, it will increase our cash flow, particularly during the first six months of the year when it's usually uh, the lowest. So that's a good thing. Uh, growth in the five-year averages around 3.2%. These are conservative, um, but again, taking into account that um, sales tax is highly volatile and it is um, highly subject to change uh, given a recession or given a slowdown in the economy. First thing people do, obviously, is stop spending money as much as they can. So we've tried to go a little bit on the conservative side for those. For charges for services, again, this is the revenue category the city has the most control over. And it's about 10% of total general fund revenues. About 50% of it comes from development. The rest comes from public works, parks, PD, and fire. It consists of permit fees, inspection fees, plan check and review fees, vehicle release, code enforcement, parking revenues, and gate and league fees from parks. The estimate right now is $29.9 million. This is lower than FY15, primarily due to the flattening of revenues in development. We are just seeing a, a slowdown in activity, and that means a slowdown in revenue. The modest growth rate of 2.5% is estimated for the five-year. Briefly, for the other revenues, business license tax is at $17.9 million. That's a growth of 2%. That's a rather steady growth we've seen. Um, we anticipate that being a fairly steady revenue over the next five years, as will room tax. Uh, franchise tax is actually several different types of taxes. It comes from mul multiple components. We have uh, Comcast, AT&T, and the PG&E franchises, which are the utility franchises, um, and those are longstanding. Those total about $8.3 million. The commercial solid waste and roll-off bins total approximately $4 million. Appropriations, let's go to the expenditure side of the, of the equation. Total appropriations total about $269.8 million, or 3.3% above FY15 estimates, and almost 5% above FY15 amended. The majority of this increase is in employee services. Category um, changes over the five year according to known circumstances and anticipated changes both in employee services and in um, health and welfare, um, operations and maintenance, and interdepartmental charges. Employee services is, as you can see, the single largest category by far. It's up 7.7 .7 million over FY15 estimates and about 5.7 million from FY15 amended. The primary reasons for this are the MOU increases that will be going to FPOA. There is a 2% increase budgeted for uh, July of this year. There will be another in December of 2016. 2.5 million uh, of the increase is for increases in sworn staffing in the police department. We'll get into that later. It includes positions for FACS, school resource officers, illegal dumping issues, um, and burn grant, uh, burn grant activities. Also, we have 1.25 million for minimum staffing pay connected to the new fire company that you've heard of and $500,000 for positions in the city attorney's office, the fire department, code enforcement, finance, and personnel services. And I will review each one of those in turn as we go through the departments. In the five-year forecast, this increase, the increases in this category vary according to the known MOU requirements that we have right now. We've worked those into the five-year. Also, the additional uh, six officers that we plan on adding, at least at this time in, in FY17, uh, for the remainder of the burn grant to work in neighborhoods. Uh, there are also full year costs of the officers that are added this year, since the officers that are being added this year are being added over the course of the year. And so their full cost will not hit 
until 17, and that has also been worked into the 17 um, um, forecast that you see in front of you. This category, it might, might just a quick reminder, also includes things other than salaries, includes leave payoffs, overtime, premium pays, workers' compensation, and other personnel costs. There are a total of 48 new positions in the general fund. The vast majority of those are in public safety. Health and welfare costs are up 1.1 million from FY15 amended. There was an eight and a half total increase in premium, but due to some changes in the MOUs, the city uh, shared that increased cost with most of the unions uh, with a 50-50 split. So the increase to health and welfare was less than we had anticipated, and that helped tremendously. Um, the category is much more complex now because seemingly each unit has its own um, MOU requirements and for new employees versus um, old employees, et cetera. So it becomes a bit more of a task, but we do have a total of $18 million budgeted for health and welfare in the city in the general fund. Uh, citywide, we have $35.1 million, so that's how much health and welfare is costing us for next year. The retirement contribution, as always, is based upon the um, rates that are, are given to us by the retirement board, uh, by their actuary, and this continues the step-in. These rates that are reflected here continue the step-in of the decrease in return from 8 to 7.5%. I believe this is the last year of the step-in. We also take into account uh, increases with MOUs and the various increases in staffing that will happen over the course of the next five years that will impact that rate. And overall, the growth factor for health and welfare just as a category as a whole is 3%. Operations and maintenance is up only $774,000 from, from 15 amended. Um, that's primarily due to support costs for PD and the fire positions that are coming online. They do have equipment needs and, and whatnot, and those are all contained in here as well. Interdepartmental charges, the next category, which are charges that um, uh, the internal service funds charge to other departments for their services are going up. Part of it is the replenishment of the SIR, the uh, self-insurance retention which has to be kept at a $3 million level. That is the city's deductible. And so we have ensured that that uh, maintains a $3 million level. We've also made an increase of, a mil of half a million dollars for increased liability claims, uh, wanting to ensure that we have enough funding for that and that we don't run short and have to dip into that SIR during the year. We've also uh, increased uh, ID charges for um, uh, internal services for uh, the replacement of PeopleSoft. That is one of our main financial systems that will have to be replaced within the next, I would say, three to five years. That will be a multi-million dollar project. Um, and so we have, um, we have begun to build a reserve uh, of at least a million dollars a year to try to slide into that cost. Also in this category are the lease payments for PD vehicles, motors, and half payment on 50 more marked vehicles for the police department. This completes their cycle of replacement. We also have uh, the cycle of replacement for uh, fire vehicles. That is also in here as well, the eight-year uh, rollover of their complete fleet. The last category that you have on your general fund summary is transfers. The vast majority of those are debt service. All debt service obligations have been funded and are expected to be paid as, as they should be next year. Um, we did have one uh, debt service drop off. The street light debt service was paid this year, so you will not be seeing that anymore in, in the detail. Um, these transfers do not include any payments for the POB. Those are taken in a different, in a different way. Uh, but the total debt service for the general fund is about $33.6 million. The total debt service that we have for um, next year is about $17 million. Those are the actual current payments that we have to make. Okay. Just to also uh, let you note that the uh, drop in FY19 in your five-year forecast is due to Blosser going away. That will finally be paid off. And the gap settlement to the airports will also be paid off in FY18. That will save us another $800,000 a year. That has also been scheduled into the five-year 
The general fund reserve that you see um, in, the, uh, in the general fund forecast on page um, 843, the balance is 4.9 million as of today. It includes the first RDA loan repayment, which was received in January, and the proposed growth of that is, as you can see, funded by both uh, the repayment of RDA loans and contributions by the general fund. That concludes my presentation for the general fund overview. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Member Brand. Oops. Lee. <laughs> okay. Hi, Jane. Oh, good morning. Um, just a few observations on this. I actually went back over the weekend and, and went back to uh, 2010. And I think that was probably the, uh, the low mark since I've been here, um, the FY 2010 budget, and looked at the, um, the difference between you know, the major general fund funding sources, uh, property taxes, sales tax, room tax. And in 2010, we had 60 million for sales tax, and now we're up to 82.2. That's like $22 million. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a major recovery. Yes, it is. It's hard to um, directly compare the, the property taxes because it had that. You're combining two categories now. Yes. But it was, pro it was probably, that was, I'm guessing, was probably up at least $10, $12 million, too. Approximately. Actually, I think it might be a little bit more. Yeah, and then room tax went up almost two million dollars um, franchise tax four million dollars but wasn't about three million three and a half of that from the privatization of commercial solid waste it's about four million four. when you combine the commercial solid waste and the roll-off bin franchises okay so that that added four million dollars mm -hmm. right? okay and then uh, <clears throat> I mean all the categories just except I went into for whatever reason the coup had the um, the RDA increment was a was a 3.4 back in 14, and I realized this 2.1 is probably closer to the norm that we can mm -hmm. expect. Okay. Yeah, that was an estimate. Um, the uh, RDA breakup at that time was still very very new, and there was a great deal of information out there, and the processes were very much in flux at that time, and so that really was a guesstimate that was made by um, by the RDA, um, mm -hmm. and so now that we've gone through several ROPS processes. Um, they have, I think, a more refined process um, in place, and it's a little bit easier to um, to do some forecasting. Yeah, I'm looking out um, on the five-year. You've got that, yeah, about 2.1 to 2.3. So you got it pretty consistent mm -hmm. on the uh, forecast. And then, but what, you know, if you, if you took the bottom um, categories, the... Um, charge for current services, intergovernmental revenues, intergovernmental and, and other revenue, those went down from 2014 to 2016 by about six and a half million dollars. If you take the entire, all the, for, from going from 14 of two point, 291 million to 297 million, that's roughly about a six and a half, 6.5 million increase or roughly 2.2 percent. Mm -hmm. And looking Right below it, the total expenditures of 2014, 243 million dollars, compared to 269.7 million dollars, the expenses went up 26 million dollars, mm -hmm. or 10.8 percent. I realize, like the PTAF was a one-time deal, 3.8 million dollars. Yes, but at least on the surface, it seems to be kind of a bad trend. Where you know we're, our expenses are rising faster than. Um, the revenues or the traditional revenues. Mm -hmm. is, is that correct? Well, I think that in some cases, uh, those those employee services, mm -hmm. again, it was very much in flux during that time, trying to come out of a recession and trying to um, predict where those revenues were going to go. Some recovered much quicker than others, um, and certainly sales tax and property tax have have significantly recovered. And then we also started getting the RDA increment, which we had not received before. Um, and so that was an additional uh, revenue that needed to be considered. 
Um, the charges for services, I think there was a lot of pent-up demand mm -hmm. that happened when the recession started to ease, uh, particularly in development. And I think that now that that, that built-up is over with, I think that they are experiencing a more flattening out. Mm -hmm. And there may be other factors uh, at play as far as their revenues are concerned, and we can certainly go over that when, when DARM comes up uh, for, their, for their budget review. Uh, right. as far as whether or not they know of any other particular factors that have caused that. I see it on a macro level, mm -hmm. just basically that, that they went up rather sharply, and now they're basically in a plateau. Right. I think that's kind of indicative of the, the current market out there right mm -hmm. now as far as con uh, primarily construction, both mm -hmm. residential and uh, commercial. And it looks like we've hit the apex pretty much of the, of the debt service in the general fund, and it's starting, it looks like in 17, it starts slowly declining. Mm -hmm. It's in interesting to note, too, that all the debt that's on the general fund debt service, every single item, even though one was voted in 2009 and one in 2010, were all from prior to 2009. The 2009 public safety tax was actually encumbered in 2008. So, correct, city manager, had we not... No, the public public safety bond that built oh the, the bond yeah, bond oh. so uh, yes I'm the, sorry I'm sorry public safety went, bond excuse me <laughs> hey yeah, what? I've been talking to Oliver you got the council president's <laughs> attention yeah he's gone now we're talking <laughs> yeah okay yes well. the public safety bond debt as well as the parks bond debt all that was incurred in 2000 yeah so I remember our city manager former city manager Sousa saying you better pass this deal because the money's already spent. Pretty much. The other thing was that the, the, the 2010 bond was to pay off Granite Park Met Museum, right? So really, the post-2009, there's been no new general fund bonding added on from the council or the administration other than those they had to, which is good. So we're starting to see our mm -hmm. debt service decline over time. And we saw we paid off the internal fund of last year about, of a total one time of almost $35 million, right? Yeah, it will, it will take some time. I know that I have scheduled it out, and I believe it goes out to um, 2037. Okay. So we have a ways to go on some of them. Others will drop off long before then, uh, but those, that's the, I, be, I believe that's the public safety bond that you're referring to that doesn't end until 2037. And what has really helped us unintentionally is I see the carryover at $18.9 million. Mm -hmm. That's obviously was much more than forecast mm -hmm. and was what primarily due to the, the attrition problem on, in, uh, in the police primarily? Well, actually, there were several factors in that large carryover. We had anticipated in 14 actually paying off the parking loan that was, that was made to, and as you'll all remember, um, we took out a we took, took out a loan from two enterprise funds in order to pay off the parking fund debt mm. once it came into the general fund, and so we had determined that we could pay that off in FY14, right. and so we had budgeted that way. And when the carryover was budgeted, I anticipated that it would be paid off at the end of 14. Well, through some circumstances, it couldn't be cash flow issues. Oh, we sold the, uh, I think the Radisson. We had some one-time stuff that came in. Right. And, yeah. and so we ended up paying it in, in 15. Right. And so that money came over in 15 mm -hmm. in excess to what I thought it was going to, but then we also spent it. So of that 18.9 million, 8.2 was, was used to pay off that loan. Right. So that was gone. And we had anticipated about 4.5 million coming over anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the actual carryover that was unanticipated was about $6 million. And you are correct. A good deal of that came from attrition. A good deal of it came from um, some one-time prior period adjustments in the RDA increment that we had not been told about and did not anticipate. Um, there was about $600,000 in that. There's also, there was also some additional sales tax. Uh, we came, the, the, the 6.3 million that was unanticipated is about 2% of total ongoing revenues. 
-hmm. So it didn't turn out to be a huge miss, um, but there was some additional revenue that came through, and expenditures were a little bit lower than we had anticipated. And I guess the corollary question would be the cash flow issue must be getting much easier because I know a couple of years ago we were barely getting by at the end of the year to uh, uh, finish on a positive or basis. So now is it getting easier that we have a little more latitude? Well, it's getting easier to make payroll in the last pay period of the <laughs> of the year. Right. Uh, I don't know if I call it getting easier. Um, if you look at again and. and, and Council Member Brand, you're correct. Uh, just our revenues are beginning to slowly come back, and what's being proposed, and the reason you see such a significant, relatively significant increase in costs in FY16 is, of course, as as Jane uh, indicated, there's a, a significant, a relatively significant investment in public safety. Um, we we have some safer grants in the fire department that are expiring. We're going to continue to fund, fund those positions. Uh, we're going to incrementally add 43 new sworn positions to the police department. Those will fully be recognized in FY17. Um, but and, and so when we when we approached this budget, it was very strategic, and we're trying to find again a balance between the demand to try to restore levels of service, incremental restoration of services, but more importantly, and I would have you look at uh, page A A44. That comes with a balance between trying to incrementally improve service, reinvest back in the fire department. We're fully funding the fleet replacement schedule for the fire department, something that we haven't done God knows in how long. Mm -hmm. Cover all of our debt service, which is, again, depends on what happens with revenues, especially coming from impact fees, uh, which have been down for the last two or three years, which will then subsequently come back and uh, could potentially uh, impact us because it, uh, the general fund could literally be beginning to write a check to cover part of the debt service for both parks and, and the uh, parks department in the future. But what I would point out is that with all that, at the end of, you know, 20, you know, FY19, even FY20, you're seeing that we're contributing about $2 million or so every, every year to the reserve. Right. That even <clears throat> back, if you look at future value or what the projected uh, you know, operating uh, expenses are going to be for the general fund. That's still less than a 10% reserve. Okay. So while I'm, I'm happy that we're actually talking about incrementally improving service, we are still walking a very thin line between increasing service levels, primarily in public safety, but not at the expense of the organization's financial future. I mean, that's something that we're going to need to keep in mind because I know when people look at that, wow, $6 million carryover, that's a huge number, as Jane pointed out. That's, that's less than 2% in the overall scheme of things. So I would just ask council to keep that in mind when we're de deliberating this budget this year. Well, that's my point. We're still in a precarious situation. Oh, yeah. uh, in fact, if you looked under the summary, uh, for health and welfare, $15.4 million was in 14. We're projecting $18 million in 2016. That's about $2.6 million or 17%, okay? And that's why as we go through, I know we, did, we were successful with the uh, POA as we go to the other uh, units, so we need that to contain a significant cost increase that's been escalating since I've been here. Um, a pension is, is went from 21.8 to 22.1, which is only a 6% increase. I think that also reflects what we did with the, uh, on the MOU with yes, POA, does. our biggest uh, uh, bargaining unit. So... We can continue to do that, I and mean, those are two significant costs that I think we, we, we've got at least partial handle on. And if you look at any city that had went to bankruptcy or came close to bankruptcy, almost always it was under pensions and health care costs mm -hmm. that were the, uh, the primary factors uh, contributing to the, their dire financial situation. Still are. So anyway, there's a, a little light out there now on the tunnel. Um, Thank you, uh, Jane, for my, for my seventh year here. I know you've been here longer, and for all your you and your staff and all your contributions to uh, the city. Thank you. Uh, is the screen clear? I think it is. Okay, we'll go to the next uh, item. Next item is the city attorney's office. We will start with the departmental reviews.
Good morning, Council. I handed out a PowerPoint. I won't be doing it electronically. Good morning, uh, uh, Doug Sloan, City Attorney. I'd like to start by introducing the people that you may see most often uh, from our office, our management team. Uh, Francine Kane, our Chief Assistant. Uh, Katie Dorr, our Assistant for Transactions. Uh, our Supervising Deputies, Tina Griffin and Lori Avedesian. Uh, my Secretary, Noemi Schwartz. And then, uh, because this is a position the Council added last year specifically, uh, Michael Vasquez, who is taking care of contract compliance and uh, responses to PRAs. He's really streamlined that process, coordinating those for all of the departments. Uh, looking at page two of the handout, uh, it, that's the uh, organizational chart for our office and the legal work we do for the city. I'll note that now we have 17 attorney positions in the office. We have three paralegals, two in litigation and one in contract compliance, uh, 11 secretaries and one administrative position. Uh, we're, we're having one administrative position now where at one time we had five. So we're being much more efficient in how we use our resources in the office. Uh, that's a total of 32 positions in the office. Uh, turning to page three, our budget is about $4.1 million now. That's largely a status quo budget. Uh, that's approximately the same as the city attorney's office budget was back in 2006. So it's about the same as 10 years ago. Uh, changing from last year, uh, the budget includes funding two positions that were added, one the contract compliance and then adding a legal secretary. Uh, the remainder of the increase is largely overhead, health care costs, and those kinds of things. Uh, the city attorney's office budget peaked at about $4.9 million a few years ago, and the low of about $3.7 million. Uh, we have seen budget savings of about uh, $100,000 every year of the last three years, and we're projected to save about $150,000 this year, and there won't be any carryover within our budget, so that will be returned to the general fund, I understand. Uh, turning to page four, uh, contract council costs. Even though contract council costs are not part of our budget, we manage those costs, and I think we've done a fantastic job of doing that. Uh, contract council costs peaked at about $4 million at one time. Last year, it was about $3.7 million, and this year it should be about $2.3 million, or a savings of about $1.4 million from last year. Uh, so the total legal costs in the office peaked at about $9 million total at one point, and that's down to about $6 million per year, combining our office and outside council costs. So we're saving the city about $3 million a year in legal costs. And I think we're doing that while we're providing at least the same level of service. Uh, we've done that largely through careful selection and management of outside council. Uh, we handle more work in-house, in which we can do for about half the cost of sending it out. Uh, I think we're being more efficient in how we go about things. We don't take 10 pages to write a memo on why you can't do something. Um, we're being more selective in the kinds of matters that we send to outside council. And then, of course, we're working closely with the council, the mayor and manager, uh, in making good, defensible decisions in how we go about things. Uh, turning to page five, uh, the highlights of the year, I think we've had increased response times. Frequently on council projects, we get back to you that day or the following day. Uh, we take calls, answer emails, practically 24 hours a day. Uh, and most notably, we have now had, knock on wood, a 100% success rate uh, in-house handling administrative matters and going to court. We've not lost a case in about a year and a half. Uh, looking forward on page six, the two things I'd like to emphasize is uh, we have a great group of lawyers in the office. Uh, they will continue to develop expertise uh, to refine what they do, to do an even better job for you. And then at some point, I'd like to look at some uh, modest increases for the people in the office. That's all I have. All right, Council Member Brand. Brand. Um, going back to 2000, you were here in 2009, it was in Jim Sanchez, and I would yes. talk on and off with myself and Councilmember Westerlin about the contract compliance position, and I think it took a couple of years till we finally got it right in the budget. Yeah, we uh, it took a couple of years to ramp it up. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a paralegal doing that about half time at mm -hmm. that time. Uh, it includes, you know, first of all, getting the process started, collecting a lot of contracts, and then inputting those into the system. 
And at the time, I think we could tell that we were saving the city money by finding things where either we weren't collecting increased rents or mm -hmm. getting insurance and, and that <clears throat> kind of thing. So right now, is it is it two two positions, of an attorney and a, and a paralegal, or what is the staffing? It's mostly just the paralegal. Okay. But you and I have talked about this before. Would there be a need to maybe add one position? Because what I've, you and I talked about in the past was clearly we're recovering more money than it costs us to fund the position. Well, if we had the position devoted completely to contract compliance, probably not. Mm -hmm. But we've also had him doing the PRA responses. Mm -hmm. We're funneling all of those through almost the entire city through him, <clears> and <throat> that actually takes more time than the contract compliance function. So, so if we added a position to work on both together, I think that would, that would be a good thing. Okay, so are you talking like a paralegal position or an attorney? A paralegal position. Okay, what's the cost roughly? Uh, salary is just under 50000 total cost of maybe sixty five. Okay, so can we make motions now? Yes. Okay. Yes, you can make motions now. And the way we're going to do it, you can make a motion. Right. As long as you have a second, right. we, put it, we put it into the okay. quote-unquote proverbial hopper. If I can hopper. make a motion that we add this second position with an approximate cost of $65,000 to the, uh, the city attorney's budget, uh, with a offsetting cost to be determined. Second. Okay. And I, again, uh, just to f f uh, final thoughts on that, I believe that the 65000 will be paid back many times over. Just you take a, a given lease, a lease that has, for example, an, an escalation clause, that because there's, you guys are inundated with thousands of pages of documents and nobody's paying attention, it goes by one, two, three years, it's not implemented, the lease terminates, the tenant's gone, and the city lost, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars that they never collected because nobody was, you know, watching and monitoring these kind of events, particularly on leases. Um, then the, the, the uh, second question is, since the impact of the uh, Litigation Management Act, Act a couple of years ago with our, our, our two star members, Brandau and Capriolio, how would you say that's impacted our budget so far? Well, our total outside council costs at about the time that started were about $4 million a year, and it's down to about $2.3 million. I'd say that's a significant factor, uh, largely being more selective about how we handle our litigation, uh, what, when we file suit, and how we defend lawsuits, okay. and using more local uh, outside council lawyers at a cheaper rate, too. Right, because you know, since I've been here, I mean, we've all seen, unfortunately, a string of lawsuits that, for, for the most part, we lost. Thousands of dollars were spent, and you know the, the the major thrust of that litigation management act was to bifurcate between being a plaintiff and a defendant. Because if you're sued, you got to defend yourself. But if you elect to become a plaintiff, you're making a, a decision that may cost a lot of money. So I think, at least what I've seen since then, I think we've made some pretty good decisions. We had two great uh, contributions by our council members there. Um, so anyway, I think it's worked out, and I, and I want to thank you and your department, all your people who, all the stuff I go through, I, you always have people that are responsive, do good analysis, and I just want to extend my thanks to your, you and your entire department. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a real quick overview, council members. Uh, if you'd like to make a budget motion, make the budget motion. We get a second, we put in the hopper. We'll try to do our best to keep a, a, a tally, maybe weekly, about where, where we are so you can kind of review where we are. All right, uh, next up, Council Member Soria. Given that this is my first budget, so there are just a very small questions that I have. I, I was just looking at the line item. Um, for your department, and so I wanted to ask in terms of employee awards, what is that line item? I'm for? sorry, I couldn't hear. For employee awards, I noticed that um, this year we went up from t from the previous year having 216. Um, the the and cost allocated to now 8,800, and so I was wondering what that is. Uh, employee awards would be uh, employee of the quarter. Uh, recognition when somebody makes you know 10 years or leaves the office those kinds of things so what do you guys usually do I'm sorry eight thousand uh, I'm you, like I don't want to be nitpicky but I'm like eight thousand dollars for so I was just wondering. we probably don't spend that much okay. I would be surprised if it's half that well because much. your budget yeah, from actual. 2014 went from two hundred and sixteen to eight thousand eight hundred 
And so I was just you, wondering that. Doug, Doug if I could, change. the numbers that the council member is quoting are your actual expenditures versus what you're proposed in this year's budget. Yeah, it shows our actual expenditure in the last year was $216. Okay. And uh, so that's what you guys... Right. I don't know why it's projected to be 8800 We can talk to budget about reducing that. Yeah, I'm just curious if that there's a particular... The, that was one of the... Okay. Um, that, was, that was rolled over from the prior year. Um, so that, that amount had been in there in a prior year, and so there was no request to reallocate that to another line Anything item. Else? And so, um, but as you can see, they usually come very close to using their entire budget every year. And so that money, if not used for employee awards, is more than likely used to support other things within the city attorney's office budget. We could reallocate that towards the contract well, compliance function. And that's what I was going to say, because I know that my colleague just made a motion to add, right? That's correct. So in looking at some of the funds already there within the budget, if they're not being used, because it shows that you guys haven't really used them in the past, um, maybe it could offset some of that. Right. Uh, that contract compliance position probably could be funded largely through being absorbed in our existing budget through those types of line items. Okay. And then the other question um, on the other line item, just wondering what is for professional services and consulting, and then it cuts it off, what, what do we usually um, fund under that? I know that the budget kind of has fluctuated. We've, in 2013, we were at 107, about 107,000. Then we budgeted this year 167,000, and we've, we're proposing next year 133. So I'm just wondering what kind of things right. you guys fund with with Most that. of that is an independent contractor, Larry Donaldson, that we hired to be our police advisor. He's a retired employee from the city, and uh, most of that is payment to him. Uh, the balance would be certain professional services we need uh, that aren't passed on to individual clients within the city, or at times we actually employ outside counsel to provide us general advice that's not billed to any particular department. Thank you. That was it. Councilmember Capriolio. Thank you. Uh, congratulations. Um, I, I think your department is a role model, truly, uh, mm -hmm. for reaching such efficiency levels that you've done since you've taken tenure as a city attorney. And your team and staff have all worked together. And it's, uh, for me, very inspiring that we have employees that are willing to make these changes and produce the efficiency you have, the financial budget you have, the reorganization that you have, which has resulted in more efficiencies. And from that, we have a higher production rate and the quick responses to our legal issues. It's, uh, you guys are just, you're superstars. And I wanted to acknowledge that and tell you that because, uh, uh, again, I think that's your role model for other departments and their budget review should maybe take a, a lead from yours as to how efficiency things can be done uh, with good, true leadership like you, so and your team, so congratulations and uh, thanks, Council Member Brand, for acknowledging uh, Council Member Brandell and myself on the litigation reduction committee because it's working with you and the team. We're I think we're small players, but we're part of the team and we enjoy it and want to continue uh, with that production from our point of view and from our efficiencies and the things that we bring to the table. So I think it's a great team effort and congratulations. Thank you. Councilmember Cantero. Hey, Doug. Okay. Good job, Jane. Thank you. Councilman. You're welcome, as usual. You forgot the donuts. I miss Mike Lima. <laughs> I know, but he usually brings the donuts. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, Doug, I, I want to uh, thank you and your office. You guys have done a tremendous job. Uh, uh, you know, I see a real uh, even-handed approach from your office uh, as far as serving everyone, and, and I think that that's really important. Uh, 
giving us that level of, of uh, confidence uh, from throughout your office. So I really appreciate that. And I think, uh, you know, as usual, uh, you know, you when you first took the position, you started making a lot of uh, a lot of changes, and uh, uh, it's, it's been a good. Uh, a good job as far as you know you you had to make a lot of cutbacks like a lot of other departments but it seemed that at times uh, some of the uh, the attorneys and staff were multitasking which they probably were so and they've really been uh, good at at uh, providing the information and in a timely manner as well the um, The response times uh, have been real great, and I really appreciate, too, getting the updates on just the overall work that, that you folks are doing because sometimes it generates some questions or something that, that we've heard uh, that might be helpful or might not be helpful, but uh, it's, really, it's really important uh, to get those, and, uh, and I think it just keeps us abreast of uh, what's going on. One of the things that, um, that you mentioned was... Uh, um, and I was happy to hear uh, Councilmember Brand uh, make the motion for uh, $65,000 for a legal analyst. One of the things that uh, you asked for as far as, I guess, part of your wish list was that uh, to see if we can provide some modest raises for the staff. Uh, which staff would this be? Well, I know there are negotiations going on with the represented staff, and then uh, the balance would be for the lawyers in the office. Uh, last summer, with the changes for all of the unrepresented uh, employees, that amounted to, I think, close to a 5% uh, difference. Uh, so some modest increase would help get some of that back. Okay. So that would be the unrepresented staff? Yes. City manager? Is, is there anything we can do about that? Uh, we have a number of unrepresented employees, not just in Doug's office. We did take steps about a year ago to restore the the three percent that was um, uh, imposed, as well as some other things. But like everybody else, uh, the unrepresented staff actually stepped up six years ago with uh, a number of uh, concessions in order to try to help us through the the tough times. So. Uh -huh. We, we can certainly look at that, but it's not just in Doug's office. We have a number of people, some of them, two of them, three, four, five, six, seven, ten of them sitting out here in the audience. So I'm sure they'd be interested in hearing whatever I come up with, with and, represent, and recommend to the mayor. Okay. Well, then, uh, you know, since it's citywide, then I guess we can say, uh, would we be able to get a report uh, during this budget time, uh, just kind of an update on those unrepresented uh, employees that we have? And, and see what's out there in terms of what what has been done or what you're working on or that type of thing. Because I'd like to make a motion on that, but I don't want to just jump out there and say, well, oh, Doug only, Doug, Doug's office only, you know. Can we Why don't you, uh, let me work with the personnel department to get okay. you some data and maybe we'll take it into closed session and we can deal with it there. And then we, we can come back at a later date and see if, if we're able to uh, to come up and, and make a, uh, a motion that, you know, might be beneficial. Okay, so we'll get that before the end of budget, right? Yes. <laughs> All right. Not in July. Don't July to me. Okay. Uh, let, let me just uh, kind of clarify what happened here. So, Councilor Quintero, you, you want to just direct staff to bring that information back to you before budget's over, so we can talk about it in closed session. Yeah. No, I think what was, if I could, Council. I think my understanding is that. The council member would like the information discussed and shared in closed session before we conclude with our budget deliberations. Okay, but prior, okay, prior to budget, budget, got it. Yeah, and the reason I want to do that is that it's not just in, in uh, Doug's department that has those unrepresented employees, and I don't want to just make a motion for his office. That way we can look at the whole picture. No, got it. Just want to make sure that when we capture it, we capture it right. Yes. Uh, right, okay, got yeah. it. Thank you for clarifying that. And uh, so, Doug, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Appreciate you and your, your staff and the, the attorneys doing his, uh, so much with so little. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'll ask just a, just a, a couple questions and a uh, comment or two. Just want to also uh, echo the sentiment of my colleagues and thank you for your efficient handling of the office. I think uh, 
clearly, um, you know, with the Litigation Management Act, with our uh, crack team of litigation uh, reduction uh, um, committee here, uh, that you know we we work together to really uh, reduce some of the the overhead and costs, especially with uh, outside counsel. I think that has been a huge impact on on our budget in this office. Uh, kind of switching to making sure that we are focusing on local attorneys and, and kind of we know we need outside counsel, but uh, making sure that we're we're using cost effective ones has, has been a, a major shift. Want to certainly uh, commend you and your team along with my colleagues for 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 moving that. Kind of what do you see, uh, Doug, as uh, your top goals for next year, as we this this, this next year coming up. Uh, again, the top goals I think are to just continue to develop expertise in the office. A lot of our lawyers are fairly new at what they do here uh, to get better and better at what they do to continue to win cases and then, like I had said, maybe get some increases for uh, the people in the office. And when you say develop expertise, are there specific areas that you like to see that expertise uh, developed in? Um, well, we're seeing a lot of work, of course, in land use. We can always get better there with general plans, specific plans. Uh, development code, uh, and with development coming back in the city now, more and more there, uh, I think we can get more efficient and uh, keep more of that in the office, uh, continue to win cases uh, in the labor and employment area especially. Uh, and then with the, the fee matters, uh, we've got a lot of things going on with fees, impact fees, and, and those sorts of things, Develop it, and then water law. Councilmember Quintero, did you want to say something really quickly to that? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Doug, one of the things I forgot to ask you, would you be able to provide us also with a list of how many uh, settlements your office handled this year? Yes. The, this fiscal year, I think that's a good number for right. us to look at. We can at. do that. We provided a uh, comprehensive review of litigation uh, results back in January. We can update that list. Yeah, I'd like to see the current numbers. we Will do. Thank you. All right. I'd like to, to also flag on that list of kind of those areas that you're trying to gain expertise and prioritize. Just make sure that we are, you know, we did a lot of work with the Code Enforcement Committee this past this past year. Uh, I know that there are a lot of uh, mechanical issues that still need to be figured out with that. And I want to just make sure that we really um, uh, have an attorney or, or a team dedicated to that that's really working with our, our district attorney, too. Uh, to make sure that we can file certain cases when they need to be filed. We want to make sure that we are, you know, uh, appropriately enforcing code enforcement. And I know a big part of that is going to be from with the help of your office. So I just want to throw that in your mental hopper um, about what's a, a pretty big priority, at least to me, and, and I know a few other members of this council. Um, do you have any uh, uh, multi-year projects uh, in, in, in the head, that, in your head, that you're kind of working on that you'd like to see that, that's either in progress or going to be carried out? And how are we going to implement that? Well, as far as the things we're working on, I'd say one of the biggest areas of the law that we could always use more improvement on right now is water law. Mm -hmm. We're really impacted by that. I could see that being a large bulk of what our office is working on and maybe keep develop more expertise in-house. Largely, we've had to rely upon outside counsel in that area. But with all we have going on between the construction projects, uh, issues with the federal government and others concerning water law. I think we we're going to have to really ramp up in that area. And right now, do we do in, in your estimation, do we have the appropriate resources to uh, begin to develop that expertise? I, I'm I'm with you on water law. It's it it may in fact be uh, one of the most complicated things that we do up here as a body in in, in trying to uh, discern which is the the appropriate course of action to take with, when it comes to water. So. I'm, I'm glad that's on, on your on your list. Is there anything that you're lacking in this year's budget to help develop that? I don't think so. We have a, a few lawyers that have started ramping up in that area. Uh, I can't see hiring a high-level expert in water law quite yet. Uh, the one outside counsel that we rely upon for this largely is Rob Saperstein. Uh, and there's no way we can replace what he does or what he knows. Okay. But I think uh, developing that support within the office, I think we're on our way to doing that, and I think we'll get there. Okay. Um, that, 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 that's good to hear. The other area I think that uh, I'd like to just kind of pop in your, your mental hopper to is uh, with HUD and uh, making sure that we have the expertise in, internally uh, to track what we're doing and make sure we're always staying uh, uh, legal in our, you know, use of those HUD-related funds. Uh, I know that there's a, 
you know, maybe some training that, that, is, that potentially is possible for the staff that's going to be dealing with that. We, I want to make sure we're supportive of that effort. If it's not built in this budget, how do we get it in there? Because uh, that's, a very, that's a very important piece to make sure that we're executing that resource effectively. And um, I, I think we've, been, we've had some gaps in the last few years with that citywide, not, not just obviously with any one, one department, but just kind of citywide in our focus on that. So is there anything you need in related to, re- relation to that to make sure that we are closing those gaps? Uh, I don't think we need increased funding. I think now it's become higher on our radar screen, and I think we'll be working with Bruce uh, more so to make sure that we've got all the, the legal issues covered. All right, those are all my questions or comments. Thanks, thanks Doug. Thank you, Council. And who do we have next? Is it uh, finance next? For our next pre- pre- uh, department? And for oh, the next department. I'm sorry. I was distracted. There's a transmit. I don't have my list in front of me. I do have a point of clarification on um, Council Member Brand's motion. Did that I'm, you got to speak into that mic right there. I can't hear you very well. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was wondering on um, Council Member Brand's motion, uh, did that receive a second? Yes, Councilmember Capriolio oh, right. was a second. Thank you. So next up, do we have finance? Is that the next department that's up? All right. Just a word um, before we start on finance, which, by the way, starts on page B75. Um, just a word about the financial tables that are contained within each departmental section. Um, As we go through these, um, I thought it might be of some use to just very, very briefly go over. Um, As you'll see uh, in finance, particularly on page, over here, page 78, the, the charts begin, and the first one is the departmental revenue and expenditure, and that's all funds combined. And for each department, this is a presentation basically in, uh, combining every single fund uh, from every single source that the department relies upon for its funding, whether it's capital, whether it's operating, whether it's debt service. This is the big overall 40,000-mile picture of what the department uh, does and what its resources and its expenditures are. The second is uh, a department appropriations by fund classification. And what this does is it breaks out the very same information, which is everything, uh, but it breaks it out by type of funding. So you have in finance, you have general fund, and that's about all that you have. Now, there are some departments that that you'll see over the next few days, obviously, that will be funded by a great many other things. Uh, You'll find the DPU when we talk about them. They are funded by every single type of fund except general fund. And so those columns will be uh, much more filled than this particular column is. But this is a way of delineating um, what all those total funds are and what restrictions might be Uh, attached to those uh, revenues and and appropriations. The last one is a small one down there on the bottom, the department appropriations by fund type, and this breaks it out between operating capital and debt service. And as you can see, all of finance is operating uh, for 16. There was some in there for 13. That was a residual that was moved uh, back in 14. Um, And so that basically breaks out all of their funds and their appropriations by whether they are supporting operating, whether they support capital, or whether they support debt service. There's also the uh, the staffing detail, which is done primarily by division, and that will show you the um, several years of history, including the FY15 amended, any changes that are going to be taking place, uh, proposed to take place in 16, and then what their final position summary is going to be. These tables show up in each department, and they represent the same things in each department. And so just wanted to go over that briefly with you uh, to kind of give you a reference point as as you go through these departments. So finance department is a general fund department. Its total budget is about $8.2 million. This department includes finance, business tax, purchasing, central printing, and the budget office. 
The uh, department's revenues total about 1.4 million, which is slightly above the FY15 amended budget and is primarily due to um, purchasing expanded work on capital, which they anticipate getting reimbursed for. And so that's the, uh, that's the major increase in the revenues. Um, but it is primarily funded by general fund revenues, and it takes in uh, very little revenue of its own. Expenditures and non-personnel budget totals $2 million, which is about $120,000 over the 15 amended budget. Staffing totals about $5.2 million, which is about $207 million uh, above the 15 amended. This primarily uh, corresponds to a new senior buyer that they have proposed to add in the purchasing division. They will be primarily working on capital projects such as uh, bus rapid transit, Fulton Mall, surface water treatment plant, and the high-speed rail projects. The position's cost, however, will be reimbursed by those departments that are working on those projects, and so will have no cost to the general fund. In addition, there are um, two other positions that are being refunded. Uh, they have previously been frozen over the last couple of years. One is a senior administrative clerk in the purchasing division, since they will be needing some additional clerical help uh, with the new projects that are coming in and also an accountant auditor too, which will be uh, added to the debt administration unit within the treasury division to uh, increase the amount of oversight in that division and also to, um, to do some succession planning. The other part of the budget for staffing that's increasing is a fringe benefit increase. We've already gone over these on a macro level, on a, on a, on a general fund-wide level, that the health and welfare and pension costs are increasing. And that Concludes my presentation for finance. If you have any questions concerning the finance department, I believe that there is staff available to answer those questions. All right, thank you. Councilmember Capriolio. Uh, could you define succession planning for me, please? I think you need additional staff for that, or at least that's in the budget. Morning, Councilman. Morning. Uh, Yes. Right now, we currently have one individual in the department that handles all debt administration for the city. Uh, we have no backup at this point. So we are adding this position, requesting to add this position so we can provide that backup uh, for that individual, as well as kind of share the workload in, in, addition, to, um, in addition to that succession. Is there anyone in-house that currently could provide that service without adding to the budget? Probably. Uh, I mean, there's clearly qualified candidates within the department that are there, but in terms of when you, when you take someone out of that function that they're currently doing, that means that they are, that leaves a hole where they're at. Uh, the department went through quite a substantial round of cuts the last few years, as most city departments did. <clears throat> so we pretty much have one to two people uh, in each function. This is one of two functions that we only have one person on right now. So there's not a lot of depth in order to uh, bring in. So we feel adding a position would be, uh, would be better. And that, that would be the primary addition for your budget? Uh, that, Since the other positions will be refunded by the various services we provide? That is correct, yes. Yeah, this is a general fund funded position. The others would uh, primarily be funded through capital or through any other billings that we might do, both purchasing positions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Soria. My, my questions are kind of along um, my council colleague here um, regarding the senior buyer position, just trying to understand, because um, I see in the department staffing detail mm -hmm. that it's only 0.75. Is that there a particular reason? for it not being full time or? It's been uh, pretty much a standard budget practice over the years that any that new positions like this one are budgeted only for three quarters of the year that first year because it takes time to do the recruitment and takes time to fill the position. So the, the budget is set up so that it's funded as of October 1st. That's been a fairly standard budget practice in past years. So the next year, if, if we approve this next year, we would see an increase? Yes, you would. You would the budget would be increased for that specific position would increase by 25%. Okay, I, I see that. So then we should kind of expect that, that if, and we should be aware of that as a yes. council, if we vote on this, you know, on, on the 19th, that next year we potentially, if we continue to um, want to fund this position, we're committing to fund it 100%. Uh, that would be correct, yes. Okay. Um, 
And then the other thing that I had a question on regarding some of the changes on your accounting and um, what was it, the business license division, is that accounting for those um, frozen positions, a senior administrative clerk and account auditor? Because I didn't understand in the detail um, portion where those were allocated. If they're frozen, do they mean that you still have them there? How does that work? If you can explain that to me. The frozen positions were uh, they were authorized as part of the position authorization resolution, but they were not funded. So when you're looking at the, at the chart on, uh, on page uh, B81, they're already in, the frozen positions are already included in the 2015 amended. The changes that you're seeing is that last year, the department received a uh, account clerk two and a customer service clerk. The account clerk two was in accounting, the customer service clerk was in business license. If it's again the same situation, they were budgeted partial year because they were brand new positions. So now you're seeing that bump up this year. And that's why you see the increase in those two divisions. But the positions that were, that were frozen, that we're asking to fund this year, they were already in the but positions that are all in this table. So it's just in terms of personnel expenditures, that's where we're accounting for. Not it's, in the detail, because they were already included in the detail. Right, yes. On the frozen positions, all you're doing is adding the funding. They're already in the position detail. That's correct. And so going back to the senior buyer one, you mentioned that it would be general fund? No, no. Uh, no they're primarily planning to be funded with uh, capital, the capital projects. Uh, as Jane mentioned, we have uh, BRT, we have water uh, projects coming up. We have uh, a lot of very high dollar capital projects that are on the horizon and we need uh, additional help to be able to shepherd those projects through. Okay. Okay, that was it. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, those are all the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next up we have tra transportation, right, Jane? All right. Okay, Transportation Facts Department starts on page B, 157. This department is funded primarily as an enterprise. However, it also has an internal service fund within it, and that's fleet. The total budget for this department for next year is $168 million. The department's revenues are generated through a variety of sources. Transit operations is primarily funded through state allocations and federal grants, Measure C, and passenger fares. The fleet management division is internal service, and their revenues come from charges for services provided to clients within and outside the city. The total resources for transportation um, for FY16 are approximately $12.9 million more than the FY15 amended budget. Not inclusive of year-end carryovers and fund transfers, the ongoing revenues are increasing by 21.4 when compared to FY15. The primary cause of this is due to reimbursements from the federal government, um, small starts grant, and Proposition 1B dollars uh, to fund BRT. And so those are being reflected within the budget. The increase will offset decreases of a little over $700,000 in passenger fares line item. The fleet management uh, interdepartmental charges for services are increasing by 24%, primarily due to the expected purchase of replacement vehicles for the solid waste division. Also in fleet, a transfer of approximately $10 million has been budgeted to reflect the return of the accumulated, accumulated depreciation, which now sits in the replacement fund, back to solid waste. This, this is not a, an, an add or a subtract. It is simply a movement of the responsibility of the money from one department to another. Appropriations for the Transportation Department are increasing by 7.5% in three primary areas. Transit operations are increasing by $2.7 million due to staff increases. And primarily that is due to increases for workers' compensation, pension, MOU salary increases for the uh, ATU, rep represented employees, a 2% increase that will be going into effect for next year. 
a $363,000 for the paratransit contract, utilities, and hardware and software maintenance. Additionally, there's an increase of $533,000 um, for four additional police officers to patrol the BRT routes and the Manchester corridor. This was offset by reductions um, and in other interdepartmental charges, but those charges are contained in the FY16 budget to reimburse the police department. The appropriations for the capital program are increasing by $10 million, again, connected to the BRT. The construction of this project is anticipated to begin next fiscal year. The overall fleet management's appropriations are decreasing by $1.6 million, primarily the result of pension and workers' compensation charges, decreases to uh, vehicle acquisition of about $2.3 million, and increases to the outside repair line item due to the use of outside vendors and fuel increases um, that we are anticipating of about half a million dollars. Staffing, we will be implementing a reorganization. The department will be implementing a reorganization intended to prepare the department for the relaunch of the enterprise. Effective July 1st, they will be funding a transfer super Transit Supervisor 2, and funding 15 permanent part-time bus drivers. Two training officers are included with an approved date of September the 1st. The establishment of an additional Transit Soup 2 is designed to narrow the current span of control and to support improved operations. The, additional, the addition to uh, two training officers will allow the Transit Soup 1s to return to full field operations these positions will focus on continuous evaluation of training materials and implement training programs that are dedicated to building a culture focused on key service areas such as customer service. The 15 PPT bus driver's cost is approximately 668000 This is partially offset by a decrease in overtime. And that concludes my presentation on transportation. Thank I believe you. The de sorry, I believe the department is here to answer any questions. Sure. All right. Uh, Council Member Quintero. Morning, Mr. Marshall. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Just uh, have a couple questions uh, and more, um, more so related to the council district that I represent. Um, in past years, uh, I've had some conversations with Mr. Downs, and um, I, I understand about, you know, having the right amount of ridership in order uh, to create a, uh, uh, a route and that type of thing or to have some bus uh, service. And um, do we, we currently go out to Malaga? Uh, we do to the, um, to the hospital, Children's Hospital. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm no, going the, the southern other way. part of the yeah, I'm going the other way. Oh. Uh, You're on the wrong yeah, bus the, route. The, the 41. Uh, 41 takes you to Malaga. You take 40, 41 to Malaga? Route 41. Oh, it's Route 41. Route 41. Okay. Uh, now, how does, okay, how does that, uh, that loop back? I mean, what, what street does it take to go out to Malaga? Okay, so it'll take Chestnut to go to Malaga. Okay, okay. The, the, the reason I'm asking now in, uh, in particular is that um, the, the one that I, I keep, uh, I guess, bringing up each year is uh, Jensen and Willow, which is probably a half mile uh, east of Chestnut. And, and looking at that loop, uh, I don't know if it's doable to to have a bus go to uh, to Chestnut and I mean to Jensen and Willow, and basically it'd be the northwest and northeast uh, corners. We have a mo uh, mobile home park on the uh, northeast corner. That's uh, it's called the Willows, and it's 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 got quite a few elderly folks there. 
Then across the street, we have a small uh, housing project that was built by self-help, but in particular in that, in front of those houses is, a, um, is an apartment complex that mostly has seniors and disabled folks in there, and uh, they have a tough time getting around or, or getting uh, uh, service. So I, I don't know if that loop is doable, to, so where it would go to Malaga and maybe come back and, and make just a turnaround in that area and then get back on Chestnut through using Jensen. And, you know, if you can take a look at that, I would really be, uh, it would really be helpful for that, that neighborhood. Um, and then uh, just over on Church, just north of that, you've got the elementary school, Toronas, and, and all that type thing. And I think 28 kind of picks up that over on Butler, Route 28 does for the Fresno Pacific and senior citizens and Twilight Haven folks. But... Uh, the um, uh, I, I was just wondering if you could take a look at that and get back to me if if possible. And uh, secondly, the um, the the handy ride program. Uh, how's how's that looking for this coming year? Is it you're looking at uh, maybe providing more service, keeping it the same, or? Um. At this point, there's no there's no real change in handy ride. Right now, they are. They are pretty efficient. Okay. Uh, their on-time performance has been very good, um, and they meet the demand. So unless the demand improves, the, right now the service level is, um, is being absorbed by what they're able to do. So, uh, so far we're, we are satisfied with Handy Rise operation. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And I appreciate your help on, uh, on uh, working with us and having that uh, uh, the senior event at Mosqueda. Really appreciate your help there, and the uh, the benches as well at, at Mosqueda. Appreciate that. We're working uh, with Arnold and uh, city manager's office as well. So, really appreciate that. Thank Very you, welcome. gentlemen. Very welcome. Thank you, Councilmember Brand. I noticed um, it has um, a nine million dollar operating reserve, which is separate from the fleet reserve. Correct. And they said there was a study done, and I, we talked about this a few weeks ago. So what is the status of the fleet uh, reserve, either one? Yeah, you want to take that one? The, the fleet, fleet reserve. reserve. I think the question is, are you talking about FAX's fleet or the city's Fax, fleet? FAX, yeah. For the bus, I know actually two questions. One is there's a, it looks like there's a crossover between fleet management that covers both the vehicles and um, like garbage and disposal as well as the, the fax. Well, fax uh, doesn't participate in the mm -hmm. fleet reserve that, that fleet management administers. Mm -hmm. Fax manages their own reserve. Mm -hmm. And so we, we um, develop uh, replacement schedules based on the funding we receive uh, mm -hmm. for the buses. The fleet reserve um, for the rest of the city is, is... So they're two separate ones, is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. So and what is so the status of the, of the fax fleet? The status of fax fleet is um, we've actually improved the fixed route service. Mm -hmm. We've ordered... Uh, we've gone from about uh, an average of 11-year-old buses to uh, roughly eight years old. Mm -hmm. uh, we intend with the purchase of the 17 BRT buses to replace, I, I believe it's eight of the existing buses, and we have another 11 on the uh, um, schedule for next year. Mm -hmm. So that would take us to about seven, an average of seven-year-old buses, which is uh, right about where we want to be, actually. What's the fuel system going to be the same? CNG. Pardon? CNG? CNG. And the, the, the other ones have the liquefied natural gas, right? The, uh, the garbage trucks run on liquid natural gas. Okay. Because yes. um, I, I remember the, the conversation a few years ago, and that was, the problem was more in the, uh, the garbage trucks had a real low, they were overdue by about two or three years or longer on replacement. The, the fund was dwindling, correct? Yes, and we are working to replace refuse trucks as, as uh, part of the budget as well. We've got uh, how many is it, Joseph, this year? 
So 16 uh, buses on order for this year, and then another 16 next year. None are 60 feet, right? Pardon me? None are 60 feet, right? No, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Um, it says that you know the, the revenues went up uh, uh, about $15 million, primarily, I guess, to the, uh, the transportation grant and prop, was it 1B? Okay. okay. But it said that the fares were down 753000 So is there a reason why fare? Is it because gas prices are going down? No, there's, a, um, there's an interesting ridership problem. Um, we are so over capacity at different times. And uh, when, the, when the service was reduced, mm -hmm. uh, a portion of that was we just can't get enough people on some of the buses. And that's why the 15 part-time people uh, will be so important. It will fill in those gaps, at, mm -hmm. allow us to add what's called trippers. So it's, it's a, uh, where you add a bus in between your, your regular service, uh, we'll be able to pick up more people uh, and revenue at that point should stable out and hopefully lift ridership again. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing overall the ridership has been down the last couple of years? Ridership has been down and mm -hmm. again that's um, uh, in a very large part because of the overcapacity issue. So it's showing that, we, that the demand is there and the ridership is there. Mm -hmm. We just don't have capacity for, for riders. Well, I know it's kind of the question of basically do you have fewer routes and longer extended hours in service or do you have less hours and more routes? Right? We had this whole discussion about a year ago, right? Right. Um, at, at this point, the, there's a need to look at uh, the entire system. Right. And, and BRT really is an opportunity uh, for us to refashion the system completely, look in, at, at the routes, see whether they make sense, uh, see whether we're going to where we need to go to. And that's our, our larger purpose in this budget is to prepare us for major change, not minor change, major change. Right. So we want to improve the span of control. We want to have supervisors actually out in the field to respond to issues and problems. Mm -hmm. um, we want to take a lot of that burden from the driver to make independent decisions to now making more of corporate decisions. Um, the, uh, the, the span of control right now is very, very weak. You think about it, there's a manager, there are supervisors, and then there are drivers. So it doesn't allow for any kind of career path. And, mm -hmm. and again, the span of control is very weak. And what we attempt to do in this budget is to change that extremely where uh, we're able to make sure that we're operating efficiently and have people right. on the streets to ensure that. What, what I'm thinking is as we uh, have adopted the general plan, which has a primary component of the Blackstone and all the transit corridors, uh, the BRT, which will be starting next year, correct? So, you know, and then, 17. John, I know, have you guys done the, I know this, the software can really, you know, crunch down these numbers in terms of what's going to take, what's the proper way, you know, in terms of the number of buses, the number of routes, the length of time, to really boil that down. I think we can make a lot of improvements. Um, hey, have you done anything lately, John, on, on the... Uh, this? Yes, council members, I think you probably re recall we had Jarrett Walker and Tony Mendoza here last year. That was part of a strategic service evaluation which was being conducted by the Fresno COG. I'm actually taking that final report to the Fresno COG this month. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of work there. And yes, there are a lot of things we've learned and a lot of things we can do. And I think what Brian was referring to about mm -hmm. looking at the restructure was really that effort. You know, how, yes. do, we, how do we go forward? Um, I think the intention at this point is to go out and do a, a very involved public vetting of the programs that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And uh, because you just you can't just throw these things out. You really have to be very careful about it. Right. But, but if, if the... If the study is as accurate as I believe it is, we have a great opportunity to make some significant improvements in the service. Okay, thank you. And we had a council subcommittee, right? On the, is it still functional? We're still trying to get it up and going. Okay, all right. Thank you too. I know you you got here about a year ago, so you came on with all the, <laughs> all the, the, 
the, uh, the all the uh, BRT, general plan, and so on. So, yeah, my my uh, this uh, hope is that we can find the best way to implement this in the in the most precise, cost-effective, useful. Particularly, again, everything on this general plan is tied into transit corridors and BRT and so on. So, I think it's incumbent that we find that solution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilmember Brandau. Don't pull it. All right. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate um, a, a lot of my questions have been asked but since I punched in by Councilman Brand. And uh, so I want to, but I would, would want to clarify. I just walked down and asked, asked the city manager about this. So about a year ago, or a little over, maybe it's about a year ago, we had this big study done, which which John just referenced, um, that is going to determine the best uses for monies within facts and transportation. And so, and I, and this is, I think, what Lee was getting at. And the city manager kind of cleared it up with me a little bit. We're probably going to hear something about the the final result of that study within 60 days. Some something's going to come back before council. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So, so we'll have a chance to vet and look at all of those different options when, when you make that presentation. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Because that, that took, that, that had a lot of my, a lot of my questions. A lot of us council members are thinking about a huge um, workshop that we did last year at the end of the study. And so we're, we keep thinking, well, when are we going to pull the trigger on, you know, a new, approach to transportation in the in the city so that's why i think you're getting pounded with different questions like this so i'm going to save mine on that issue until until uh, that day but my other questions are about the 15 new people i wanted to clarify so um and i'm looking at page b160 so we're gonna and we just talked about this a couple weeks ago we're gonna hire 15 additional part-time people and and those people are going to, they can, you just mentioned they can add, they can get in and hit when you're over capacity on a couple routes, which is fantastic. But really one of the main things that they're going to do is they're going to satisfy this huge demand that's being placed on our current drivers, right. which will begin to bring overtime back down into a more feasible level is that correct that that's absolutely right we've got uh, a workforce where a good percentage works six days uh, there's no getting around it the need is there um, at one point there was an issue of uh, uh, productivity and our overall productivity was low well we're pleased to say now workers comp from uh, November till now we recovered 11,000 hours so we're moving in the right direction on that. Uh, but again, those part-timers will do exactly what you said. They will, they will help us in terms of reducing that six-day, forcing the employees to work a six-day. Uh, in addition to that, they'll also help in terms of the overcapacity issue. Right on. Okay, I think I'm good. I think I'm good for now. I'm going to reread some of these numbers <clears throat> and might have some more questions for you later on in the week or so. Certainly. All right, thank you, Brian. Thank you. Councilmember Olivier. Thank you, Council President. Hi. Good morning. Just a, a couple of quick questions. I'm not sure if I caught, is, is FACS going to begin implementing sweeper buses to take folks home after work uh, in, in, the new, in the new budget, or is there a plan to do a sweeper bus? Or No, but um, I, I kind of got where you're going in, in, the, in terms of the idea of expanding service. Um, I'll tell you, at some point, we've got to take what we have and, like, really make it solid. Mm. Um, I, I'm cautious about saying, fine, let's do more because we've got to do good with what we have and then figure out where we expand next. Well, in your, in your experience, and, and for city manager as well, and I know that you and I have gone around and around for years and years on this, but would more people ride the bus to work if facts could take them home after work? And they wouldn't have to get rides. I'm not sure that we've proven that, and, and, <clears throat> and hopefully some of that may come up in the uh, strategic services evaluation. Um, but again, next year has to be our opportunity to look at all options, to figure out 
uh, really how do we maximize this service? How do we make sure that it serves people? And, and again, I, I, the way that I approach transportation is not from just simply moving people from A to B. It's got to be an economic development tool. It's got to be where uh, we make sure that business is working and flowing because we are efficient in what we do and we are reliable uh, and all those things that to, to help support good business. Well, I, I can appreciate that, that you view facts as, a, as an economic <clears throat> development tool, but uh, for us, getting people from A to B is the most important thing. Uh, and I can say that very confidently. I don't think that a council member would disagree with me because we're the ones that, that are actually on, I mean, and, and you're literally on the streets with, with the people of the city every day, but we're the ones that are also on the streets uh, with our constituents every day. And a, a complaint that we get uh, quite often is because of a lack of a sweeper bus to take people home after work. And the swing shift folks, there are lots of them, 2 to 11s. So I would be receptive to even maybe a pilot program to see uh, if, uh, you know, if, if there is a need for that, um, because I think that it would be, uh, and again, I've been saying this for years, even before you got here, um, I think that there is a need to take our swing shift people home, and I think that the, um, they, they do that in other uh, transit authorities, and I think it would be great to, to even explore as a pilot program a sweeper bus to take folks home. My other question is, um, where, where in the budget, or, or can I be... Um, can I get the information as it relates to um, cleaning, uh, rehabbing, and just um, P&M? Um, really, really quickly, Councilmember Willie, yes. I just want to go back to your, were you making a motion for it? I'm not. Oh, okay. No, I'm, I'm not making a, a motion because, I mean, I, we'll, we'll trust the <clears throat> professionals to, to, I mean, I, I know that your heart's in it and that you want to take people home, but we, we can't be a tool for economic development if we can't take folks home after work. Um, and that includes the swing shift people, the two to eleven um, people. Um, you know, let me let me think about that for a second. But first, let me ask. Um, I'm also concerned about the. It may sound corny or it may sound cheesy, but I know that Bruce, you know that I'm sincere when it comes to the value of the people who who use your system. Your customers, uh, I believe, should feel valued when they board our buses, and I think that they should feel valued. Um, when they get off our buses. And I know that that's sometimes challenging to provide a clean, safe um, environment, especially in, in uh, some of the neighborhoods in our city that are uh, economically disadvantaged. Um, but, um, you know, there, there is no question that your system and your department is the, um, um, the foundation upon which the city of Fresno will be built for the next uh, several decades because of that general plan vote. Uh, it's a lot of pressure that's being put on our transit system, uh, but that's why I think that all the more reason why you folks should have your ducks in a row. And um, I think that the condition of our bus stops in the city of Fresno is deplorable. And I know that it's not, I mean, you just got here, and I know that our, our folks have been working hard with a very um, limited staff and limited budget, but I think everyone in this room can agree that the condition of our bus stops is, is, is bad. And I think that that sends a message to our bus riding public that you're not valued as, as a resident and you're not valued uh, as a rider. And so um, I think that if we're going to we hear so often from this building, well, we're going to get people to leave their, their cars at home. And when they leave their BMW at home, and they're, they're going to select facts to take them. I think that if we're trying to do two things, we're trying to be, uh, provide a service that's clean and safe and efficient for people who don't have cars and they need to get around. We also have to provide a clean, safe, and efficient system for those new Mercedes-Benz owners that are soon going to leave their cars at home and opt to take public transportation downtown for work and for play. So um, what is your department going to do to PM bus stops and try and um, steam clean, scrape off bubble gum, and, and attack the problem of graffiti at our bus stops? I'm, I'm smiling because you must have read our playbook. Okay. Uh, we, we sent a, uh, a memo last week about that uh, where we want to do just that, begin to steam clean the major places, uh, do a deep cleaning on every bus, um, and that's the, that's the next wave. Again, we're, we're sensitive to uh, BRT can't operate in isolation. We understand that. It's got to be a whole system that will attract people. So uh, with that said, we're going to have the, the workers focus 
on two or three buses a night with a deep clean, not a surface clean where we run the mop and- Is that different than now? Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt. Is that it, different than it, now? It, it so currently they're now. doing zero we, a night or one a night? We don't do the, the, like a major deep cleaning. Okay. We do kind of a clean, but it's not to the satisfaction. It's not to the place where we really need it to go. If it turns out to be we have to do one bus a night in order to do it very well, that's what we'll do. But you'll see that change. You'll see the change on the street where uh, again, we'll, we'll, we'll steam clean the, uh, the ground and make sure the shelters are done. We'll go bus stop to bus stop. Okay. Um, it, it won't happen overnight, but again, we're, we're sensitive to kind of this relaunch and in order to do that, we've got to come back with something better. So this are you, is the start of that. Are you confident that you have enough resources to do this on a, on a bigger scale? Because this body will vote to give you the tools that you need to do this on a grand scale and make it happen, because I know that everyone here is sincere that we want to have clean and safe bus stops. So, I mean, is there, you're, you're pretty um, confident that you have the resources that you need and there's nothing else we can do, go get grants or something for you? No, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I, again, we are looking at everything and everybody. And the real question for us is how do we, we get 150% out of everybody? How do we make every effort a really good effort um, I've got to applaud Jim Shad for uh, really going into the trenches to make sure that the cleanup effort is is really going to be done well. Uh, we were using some, uh, you know, some we we had some additional labor that we kind of negotiated with. Um, so I, I am I'm, I'm okay. confident that we're going to do a really good job in terms of the cleanup. But you know, one thing that that a a clean vehicle and a clean system really indicates is a pride in the work. And that's the real place that, we're, that we are re-energizing people around. Don't just come to work, get that pride back into mm -hmm. the work. And, and I know the pride is there, um, we just have to show it. And, and that's where we are right now, is kind of re-energizing people to show it. Well, thank you, we're, we're very happy to have you here and we're very happy to, to support our transit system because we, I, I realize how important it is to our community. Um, I, th I was thinking about it, and I'll make a motion, and I don't know how you wanted to, to, to handle it, um, department head and city manager, but I think that the motion I would like to make is, um, can you develop some kind of pilot program to explore a, a sweeper bus? Um, so I guess my motion would be um, to, to instruct staff to um, develop pilot program to for, for trial sweeper bus maybe on one route or, or two routes or something to, to take folks home late at night. See if, it, see if anybody rides it and if, if they don't, well, then we know. Uh, but it would, it would be to, um, to instruct fax staff to um, develop sweeper bus program, identify a route or, or several that could, if, that could use if, it. If I could encourage the, uh, the uh, strategic service evaluation, embrace a number of elements, and I'm sure that's one that it embraced. And if we can, if we can hold off on that until it comes back and then see the full scope, uh, they kind of give the what fors and the whys in their evaluation. What's the time period that we'll, we'll receive that? 60 days. 60 days? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, what I will do is I will make that motion, and then um, I mean, how, how can we work that to, to vote on this motion? Can, we do, can I ask a vote and then have it? Can I ask a question on, sure. on behalf of Councilmember Olivier? I'm wondering if they have, if there's a, since we're only 60 days away, if there's enough work that's been completed that we can at least talk about that item that uh, Councilmember Olivier is talking about, so we may be able to figure out how best to frame yeah. some work around it. Is, do you think there's enough work done with around that issue already? <clears throat> yeah. So what I'm wondering is, is if. We move forward with your motion, but at the same time, we may be able to bring that back even a little bit later in the budget hearings sure. to talk about it. Yes. Can, can we, uh, uh, Brian, are you okay with something like that? Uh, John is working with them. He okay. says we can, so. Yeah, I think that may be a, a, a good way to, because we, if we can see it, if, I, I like the motion if we can see it right now um, and then see, because they should just be in the, in the final stages if they're only 60 days away. The, the work's already yeah. completed, basically. So. That'd, be, that'd be great. Thank you. Right. Yeah, let okay. me add, the, the challenge is, and this is, this is why the discussion uh, around revamping the system or whatever we can do with the system uh, to better meet the needs of our, our, our customers, again, it goes back to coverage versus increased uh, uh, headways. In other words, 
focusing your resources where you have the highest demand versus extending routes further and further out and at the end of the day you just end up providing you know lifeline service to your your customers that, which is not convenient and is not conducive to attract new riders uh, especially going hand in hand with with our general plan and the significant investment that we're we're making and proposed to make on this year's budget uh, along the Blackstone corridor as well as Ventura and Kings Canyon the challenge for in, in some cities and, and at one time we used to do this kind of thing what you called about a sweeper bus when we had a very large employer centrally located was Fruhoff. This is back in the Sal, Sal remembers because Sal and I back in the day kind of thing. Unfortunately for us, because of land use patterns and, and how development has occurred, uh, employers uh, are spread out all over this community and where their workers reside is spread out all over the community. So we've done some origin and destination analysis, but I will tell you a sweeper bus uh, is somewhat challenged uh, in that because people work in so many different places and live in so many different places, the only real way to uh, try to provide that kind of service is just ex to, to a great part run the existing system later. Is, is there a way that we can identify potentially routes that, that use it? Because um, am I correct in assuming that the swing shift folks that, that, that take facts to work have to get a ride home? And I mean, I'm assuming if, they, if they're, they're getting a, off at 11 or 12 o'clock, yes. But the question is, is what route takes them there and what route takes them home? Can that be can that be determined? And that I mean, we, we have determined it, and that's you can take a shotgun to the city of Fresno map. They're all over, and they're all over the place. That's why I said, in order to try to meet that need, you're especially you're essentially looking at running the system for another couple of hours. And if we ran fax two more hours would cost tens of millions of dollars. Well, it wouldn't be tens of millions of dollars, but I think extending night service would probably be a three or four hundred thousand um, dollar. We, we'd get you the number. And that would be something I would suggest that we take up uh, when we deal with this in 60 days. Because in, in this case, now I'm on board too that this is an economic uh, development uh, de Department of Economic Development, because if we're bringing, if we're taking our, our work, you know, working families home from, uh, providers home from work off that swing shift, then we... And I would suggest that we deal with, we discuss this because what is missing is the, the other side is that you take that, make that kind of investment in providing that versus making an investment which increases uh, service levels during the course of the day when you have your highest demand. If the goal is to try to increase ridership and fare box revenue, there are competing priorities, and these are just two of them. Okay. Thanks. Uh, and I appreciate all that you've done um, for our, our riders. I appreciate you have to do more with less. I appreciate what you're trying to do is move these thousands of people around this huge city every day. So I, I thank you for, for everything that you do. Uh, and, and don't um, please don't misconstrue my, my comments and observations as... as um, being hostile to your mission because I know that you're really trying. Thank you. Thank you. Let me add, what you're saying, council member, resonates with Brian and as well with the rest of the staff. Brian and I have had conversations uh, with regard to the overall condition of the bus stops. There is a, uh, a significant investment and opportunity uh, in grant funding that they already have. You will be seeing uh, changes in the, the condition of our bus stops. You will also see uh, changes in and around downtown. We talk a lot about BRT. But what we haven't talked about, and it's part of the capital plan, is all the shelters at A and B shelter downtown. Uh, the technical term I use, we're just basically going to scrape the site. Right. And we're putting in all new pasture amenities there. Um, and no, the, we also have, uh, they just did a um, uh, contract that allows them to go out and buy shelters now on a and replace those shelters on a timely basis. They do have a shelf life. And they need to be replaced on a timely basis. And as, as Brian indicated, a, a, a thorough, deep cleaning of each of these sites based on the high ridership numbers that they can easily generate from, from the data that they collect. But we actually agree that you cannot entice or uh, increase ridership if there isn't a, a feeling uh, of security that comes with that, which is, again, why FACS is funding four additional police officers who will focus solely on uh, Blackstone Avenue, that's in addition to the two officers we're getting from Fresno Unified. You have six officers whose sole purpose in life is to focus on the Blackstone Manchester corridor. And so we believe in order for BRT and the general plan to work, we have to change that built environment. And improving where passengers wait for buses is part of that strategy.
very pleased with that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Council Member. Can, can, so wait a minute, let me confirm. Council Member Olivier, did, did you want to move, make a motion or no? What's your, what's your pleasure at this point? Well, I, I made a motion, I got a second, right? Okay, what was that motion? Well, you wanted to add a sweeper service. Um, you wanted well, to have a motion a, to a, explore a, the addition a pilot. Yeah, you wanted to do a pilot program. Sure. The the thought was um, we would at least look at some of the work that had been done around that around that issue. Right. Uh, prior to budget being over, if you want to defer that discussion, do you still want to keep that motion on the floor? I think I think that. Um, well, I would hate to have us vote on something and 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 expect um, vote on something, have staff do something, and then not. Would you like to withdraw it? Withdraw your motion. You know, I can make motions up until that we're done with this process. So let me let me re refine this. Maybe lean over to city manager here, and uh, and maybe we'll get somewhere. Maybe we won't. But yes, at this time, it, I'll withdraw it. Okay, very good. Councilmember Cantero. A couple of quick things that I um, failed to ask you, Brian. One is, uh, I think it was last year, or earlier this year, um, the. Uh, with the help of uh, city manager's office, we were able to install some solar lights on some of the, a couple of the bus stops in, in Southeast Fresno, and they've, they've been really effective and, and helpful. Uh, would we be able to maybe get a, a real quick report as to, you know, the, um, the effectiveness or cost of uh, having more of those installed in the, at the, uh, on the canopies of the bus stops where we have the greatest ridership, and and also a list of where we currently have them. Sure. And then uh, the other question I have is, um, uh, can do you have? Uh, and maybe it was in your playbook, uh, the um, of, of uh, making the bus stops. Uh, uh, or the buses, uh, you know, a little bit more more secure. I mean, we've had a few problems at some of the bus stops and that type of thing with altercations and that type of thing. Uh, so, I mean, there's nothing you can do to stop that. But I mean, just in terms of security cameras or that type of thing, uh, if you can kind of tell us what what the plan is. Yeah, we um, we also uh, talked about participating with uh, PD for additional cameras. Um, and, and making that part of the uh, BRT project where it gives us, you know, greater, greater focus, greater, um, greater vision. But, you know, there's, a, uh, there's an interesting challenge, um, and that challenge is the existing shelters um, provide good cover in the day, but they also provide cover at night. So here's the street light above, and yet it's dark underneath the shelter. So we recognize that as an issue and uh, want to find a way where we can, we can remedy that. Uh, I think that would be a, a big part of where that security comes in. Um, yeah. yeah, to be able to, to and, and, and it may be solar, it may be some other kind of, uh, uh, some other kind of lighting, but we're looking at that now. We recognize that that is a problem. Um, and hopefully we want to be able to remedy it by next year. Well, the, the one on Chestnut uh, south of uh, Kings Canyon is, uh, is pretty effective there. That's kind of in a little darkened area on the west side of uh, Chestnut. It's a parking lot, and it's uh, owned by the store there, and, and it's just a dark area. But that light is really helpful uh, there, so I don't know what type or what what it is, but it's a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Capriolio. Thank you. A um, couple of questions. When we mentioned solar LED, uh, I'd encourage you to look for federal or state grants. Solar seems to be a, a major uh, component of state and federal budgets. And if we can get some grant money, that could really help us out. Or, sure. I mean, you probably already thought of that, but just to confirm your thoughts, I think that'd be a great idea. Um, the second question, I, I'm, I'm not sure, it, the budget calls for $168 million of expenditures, and then total funding available, available is $201 million. What is the budget for facts? 
I mean, can I get one number and then I'd like to figure out of that number what part is general fund money? Because it uh, says council, here, uh, it what, says what here. Page, what, what council member? What page? And none of it's general fund. So. None of it's general fund. Uh, B159, B159 talks about revenues from uh, transit operations, TDA, FTA, Measure C, and then uh, page 161 talks about the numbers I just quoted, and then it says citywide general fund support. It has zero. But at the bottom of footnote two, then it kind of gets foggy to be again as to why that's even in there then. That's a general footnote that's put in every single department for those departments that do receive general fund support. This department receives no general fund support. So it wouldn't it be better and wiser to eliminate that paragraph or that footnote so people like me aren't confused? We can we can certainly do that. And and so do we know what the actual budget is or what you're asking for for the next fiscal year budget wise for facts? Yeah. yeah, the total the total appropriations for that department is hundred and sixty eight million one hundred fifty five thousand eight hundred dollars. That is how much they are requesting to be appropriated for their use for both operating capital and other uses. So that is the total budget. And you're suggesting from the revenues on the other page, we have enough to meet that uh, request. That's on page 159, service impacts revenues, upper left corner. Right. The, the revenues for this department um, will be more than sufficient to cover this. A lot of this has to do with the timing of federal grant reimbursements that they get on an ongoing basis that prove to be a significant part of their budget. And so the timing of those federal reimbursements is, is somewhat difficult to anticipate because the feds like to hold on to their money as long as they can. And so we've had to work that timing difference into the various um, uh, funding sources that, that this department gets. So our general fund will not supplement, but it will make that budget analysis correct even until we get those funds coming in from outside sources and then that money be returned to the general fund? Is that what you're saying? Or? As, yeah. When, when, when one of the transit funds goes negative, there is usually an addition, an, another fund within transit that is not that can cover that negative balance. And that's the way it has traditionally worked. If, if what you're indicating, if, if the fund did not have an offset within transit, then it would be covered by all the other funds within the city in the treasury pool until such time is its, rep, is its reimbursement came in, and then it would theoretically repay all of the other funds for, for their support. Is that accurate or true? Yes, it's true. Okay, good. And then... Um, what percentage of the citizens of Fresno, I forgot, you told us one time, that actually use the bus services? The percentage of the overall population? Yeah, it's... Um, is that a floating number? I see some people shaking yeah, their head. Transit is, is kind of tough um, in as much as there's, there's nothing that's distinct about a rider. So what we count are the number of rides. Um, and I believe it's like a million rides per... What is it? What's our right? Twelve a million, a million a month, twelve million a year. Okay, council, council member, it used to be mode split. If you take all the trips generated in Fresno County on a on a daily basis, I think the number of trips on public transportation is what three percent of all the thousands of cars, bikes, trips, people. It's about three percent. That's accurate in terms of trips. What I what I can't question I can't answer, Council Member, is the number of discrete individuals that are using the service. I, I don't know that. We know the percentage of total trips based on the COGS the forecasting model. We know the number of trips we provide. Um, but that's kind of the extent of the data we have on that. I, I just don't know the number of discrete individuals. Are there any other jurisdictions or cities of our size that have those types of numbers and information? Are we consistent with the uh, custom and trade of the industry or is there any way to yeah, determine that, that? that it's kind of of an industry issue the uh, the few systems that may have a uh, unique fare medium a fair card so therefore i can track the 
tracked by individuals that one individual took mm -hmm. 15 rides or 30 rides a month. But without that, when, when each person purchases a, uh, uh, their fare medium, we don't know if that one person purchased three times a day or if they purchased once a day. Very and, good. Th and that's kind of an industry issue. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate your help. Thank you. Council members, do you still want to ask? Council members, sorry. Um, so just have a couple questions. One um, specifically regarding the Shaw Avenue service enhancement. Um, I know that there's a note made that the department is pursuing the CMAC grant and funds um, the first three years of operating. Um, where is that identified, I guess, in, in the appropriation, um, if at all? Or is it that we don't need it until 2017? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you asked for. On the, so on the Shaw Avenue surf, surface enhancement line, okay. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out um, where the funding is appropriated in the budget, or is it that we don't need the funding until 2017? That's absolutely and, right. Okay. That's right. And so, but we are aggressively pursuing, and so we're pretty confident that we would get those funds to cover um, the operating of that enhancement? Absolutely. Is that what we Absolutely, are yes. expecting? When, when do we know if we receive it? What's the time frame for that? Um, right. time, was, council, was time frame for what? Huh? Time frame for what? In terms of those CMAC grants? They've already been awarded. Yeah. Oh, so, so they have. Yeah. Okay, because it says here in the budget, it says that the department is pursuing CMAC grant to fund for the first. We three years. we we get we have CMAC grants for the operating for three years. So we've already been awarded those funds. Right. Okay. It's, well, it's it, a, wasn't, a, it, it wasn't clear on the. Budget. Okay. That's yeah. why I was asking for. Yeah, it was before Brian's time, so that may you know we pursued those grants uh, just before Brian got here. Okay. So and we have those funds reserved to begin. Yes. For 2017. Yeah. The, the the challenge is equipment. We don't have enough equipment to do this and BRT and everything else. So we're waiting for equipment. We have to order additional buses. So is that set aside? It's in their okay. capital budget, uh, future capital. Uh, the requirements I guess contract. That's what I was trying to figure out. Where here? It'll be in 20. It'll be in the 2017 budget. It'll so be. We a, don't show it anywhere that we're carrying it along. That's my question. No, because it hasn't been appropriated. So when when we have been issued funds, even if it's future, we don't keep track of them here in anywhere in the budget. I'm just curious as to how we track those funds. The I can take a step back. The, well, the, they they are they are usually if they are budgeted by the department in their capital program, then the the capital program should show their expenditure in that future year we do not approve those appropriations because we only approve the current year budget. We do one budget year. We don't do a, 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 a two-year budget. Um, and so those funds may very well show up, and I would have to look in the uh, capital section of the budget for transportation. So it's that typical generally that even though um, we have been awarded those funds, but they are not going to be appropriated until the next budget, that we don't put it anywhere within our current budget? I'm just trying to make sure that I know right. at, for no, future so that I know where these funds and if we We don't them generally on. actually show it because we focus on the current year budget because that is what the, that is what the council is deliberating and, and that is what they will pass because y you, you can't we, or, or we don't pass two-year budgets. Some municipalities do, but we don't. So you can only vote on the FY16 budget. And so that's what we emphasize when we build the book and, and when we build the numbers. Now, as far as monies that may be dedicated to capital projects in the five-year capital project, those are contained within the capital section of the book. And so... Um, I might peruse the, the capital section or the capital summary of the book to try and see whether or not those funds are identified as being planned to be spent in FY17. Okay. 
Okay, but, generally they're, but they're 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 not contained in the current discussion because we talk about what we are going to be spending now in the current discussion. Um, if you if if obviously if council wants to talk about funding in in future years, that's obviously you you can do that. But that's why it's not in the the B sections of the book or the departmental narrative because the departmental narrative focuses strictly on the budget that we are are about ready to to begin correct and which is fine the only thing is that if you're telling me that these monies have been already awarded it would have been nice to at least make a note of that so that mm -hmm. we so that it's on record um in our in our budget mm -hmm. and we know okay. and we can look back that that's just a suggestion okay and, you know, forgive me. I'm I'm very new at this. No, it's my the, first budget, and so I'm trying to the, understand how it works. If if not we've already been awarded grant money mm -hmm. for future, I'm trying to figure out where it's placed in here. Mm -hmm. And so that that was essentially my question. No, it's a very good question because fax is very unique. Other than maybe the airports, um, all of our other departments when they're receiving federal funds, they're for capital. Uh, fax and and again maybe the airports is unique in that they actually receive federal dollars to co cover operating expenses as well. So we'll go back and look at the capital, um, but it may be that because it's an operating grant, we should have noted that that the, the service, the, the cost of operating both BRT and Shaw Avenue was funded or is funded through either a small start or a CMAC because BRT, the capital is coming from a small starts. The operating assistance is coming from a congestion mitigation air quality grant, such as is the case with the Shaw Avenue. So we'll make a note, and um, if it is in the capital, we'll, we'll provide you that information. If not, we'll note that and make improvements in the future. Okay. Do we know um, how much was awarded? Mm -hmm. What's the number? It, it, yeah, I think for Shaw Avenue, wasn't it? Yeah, she says 3.5 total, yeah. so 1.1 1 .1 or 2 a year. For the three year, three point five total for the three right. years. That's correct. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, thank you for clarifying that. The other, the other, just kind of question and more of an update. I know that we've met previously, and I had a big interest in you know the the technology component and um, being able to have the community really um, utilize um, the application um, for real time. Um, tracking of buses. I know that previously um, my council colleague have, had been working with a department in making sure that this app was developed. I know that there is a, an existing app um, that gives us the, the maps of the routes and gives you kind of the schedule. Um, and I've heard that there may be a second phase to it to try to add the, the real time um, to it in terms of where the buses are and so people know if they're running late or if they're by some reason running ahead of time. Um, people know that, especially with now majority of people having smartphones. Just wondering where that's at. It, have we appropriated any funding? Um, do we need any additional funding to make that happen? I just think that, um, you know, in being in 2015, um, our city should be, you know, um, in line with technology, and I think that that's going to not only Im could improve um, the ex access to people, but people really knowing um, in terms of times of the buses. And so, just wanted to get an update. Do we need any funds for that? Um, how can we improve? The uh, the app is ready, and uh, the app was was developed in concert with uh, students from uh, Fresno State, uh, it, it's ready. It's just a matter of uh, coming up with a secure environment, working with ISD to make sure that the firewall would not be breached. Um, as soon as they conquer that issue, we're ready to operate. Okay. Yeah, I actually downloaded the application on my phone, um, but it's just, again, very, you know, just the, the time schedule. So if you could give me a report, you know, in terms of time frame, I, there's a, a number of metros, metro cities throughout the country that have been well, you know, on this 
for years, I know that in my time that I spent in D.C. and even in um, San Francisco and in New York, they, they've been on this for a long time. So I would like to see us um, get there sooner than, than later. So um, if you can provide me an update in terms of where we're at yeah. um, and what, how, how long that will take, that would be great. We, we are anxious for it also. So uh, as soon as the uh, ISD can work out the firewall issue, we're, we're moving forward. But we're ready for it. It's okay, just so then I'll ask ISD next. Or do, Bruce, do you know in terms of um, the issue with security and um, being able to get, continue the ball rolling in terms of the work that has been done by um, some of my colleagues on this issue? I'll, I'll follow up with ISD. I haven't been tracking this particular app. I've been working on another one. So let me follow up with ISD and find out where it is. I think it's because this is a middleware and, and the platform that we use from the department for real time, and we've been using real time since the 90s. There may be some proprietary issues as well as security issues, but let me follow up and I'll, I'll get you an email back. Perfect. Thank you. That is it. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, most of the, uh, Brian, most of the questions that I had have been answered, especially surrounding around the uh, the uh, drop in, in fares and the, the ridership. I appreciate you clarifying that the interest is there, but we actually don't have the capacity to, to support the interest. <laughs> so that's uh, actually good news. And um, I was wanted to make sure that the 15 employees we were hiring, that that was kind of, you know, my, my questions were surrounding those, so you really have covered all of that. A uh, couple of, couple of um, one question I did have, um, the $9 million operating reserve that we have, is that sufficient? Uh, for now it is. That carries us. Uh, it, it's, it's a world away from where we were. Um, no, for sure. I'm, I'm it's, it's curious as away. to where you think we need to be. Um, yeah, uh, you know, clearly it can grow. I think it gives us, uh, you know, about, I think it's four months of funding, four or five months of funding. Um, I think it's a matter of trying to create that delicate balance. Um, how much do we cover ourselves for the future, and then how much do we actually put into operating? Sure. And as we've heard, there's so many operating needs, so we don't want to have such a large rainy day fund, and it's kind of raining now. So, so we're looking at that balance. And right. No, no, no. And, and, and listen, you, you probably heard me say all the time, it's, it's always about balance when you're talking about reserves. I just was curious as to your take or do we have enough or, or is the idea to try to increase this um, or, or is this, do you think with this we've achieved some semblance of that balance? I think for now the balance is kind of there. I think ultimately you want at least a six-month reserve. Okay. Uh, so we're, know, we're close to that. I mean, We're I, close to that. Okay. We're close. And to that, that was really just, just trying to gauge, you know, if how, how we would be look, you know, looking at that in the future. So if we're, if we're close, that's really kind of what I was just gauging. What does that $9 million represent? Does it mean we're almost there? Does it mean we're not close to being there, or are we there? I'm just kind of trying to get a picture in my head of, of kind of where, where we think we need to be with that. Council President, the $9 million target was established uh, a couple of years ago. <laughs> if you recall, one of our cash flow issues at the end of the year is departments like FACS and Public Works. We're waiting for Uncle Sam to write a check. And Uncle Sam sometimes isn't real fast. Mm -hmm. So the $9 million represents about the annual operating assistance that comes from the FTA. So the good news is they've got a $9 million reserve. So this year we won't have to be reaching into the general fund at the end of the year yeah, for cash flow yeah. purposes to cover payroll plus, plus the $9 million because the check's in the mail, wink, wink. So um, we can certainly look at moving that. That represents about a 25% reserve, which is given where they were last two, three years ago, which was a negative fund balance. Um, but as Brian indicated, like the general fund, it's striking a balance between that and making sure we don't go back to the point where they become a, a, a liability to the general fund at, at the no, end no. of the year. And, and listen, let me just let me be clear about the the. The, the context of the question, it was to, to understand where we're, where we're going. I get it, and I'm glad because I know what we were doing a few years ago with having to really dig into a, a general fund where we couldn't, really couldn't support that either to really, you know, pay operating expenses until we got reimbursed. No, I get it. I just was curious as to, you know, does this number represent us being there or, or, or what? So that was really, uh, really all that was about. So, um, and, and lastly, I just wanted to, um, to really comment on the bus shelter uh, thing as I know you've heard it a couple of times today, but 
certainly want to, um, you know, put my exclamation point on that. Um, we have a lot of rundown shelters in my district. Uh, we have them throughout the city, so not that my district in that sense is, is any worse off than any other district, but I'm just wondering, do we have the sufficient funding to maintain our bus shelters, in your opinion? Again, it's that balance issue, and um, it appears that we do. It appears that we, we um, I think a large part of it is going to be effort in how we apply people. Um, and um, the plan right now is to, you know, take our time and not just try to do so much. At one. I, I think we've tried to spread ourselves around too much too often. And now what's really needed is just let's pay attention, do one thing very well, move on to the next thing. And it, it kind of ends up where um, people respect things that seem to be well respected. So if it's clean often, we find that, that it will stay clean for a while. Uh, once we go through the whole cycle, um, then yes, it's probably the general wear and tear of, of, a, of a shelter being dirty, the shelter area. Uh, but the tendency is once you do a really good cleaning, people respect that cleaning, um, and we just have to focus and, and just stay methodical. Okay. Um, I'm, so, so let me just make, so you, you think we do have the appropriate amount of funding to really I maintain? I think so. Okay. I think so. All right. Um, and how do we decide where the shelters go? Um, there is a, uh, there's a ridership study and the, the ridership analysis and the ridership analysis, uh, based on the number of people at a place, um, shelters are of course a big commodity. So, uh, we look at the, the places where there are enough people to support, uh, the shelter. So the higher number of ridership, uh, the greater the likelihood for shelters. Um, and there's a, there's a need for us to look at the whole shelter program. Are, are we uh, putting out enough shelters? How many do we have left? Uh, again, 2016 is kind of this, 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 this uh, big transitional period for us. How do we know that we're doing it right? Firstly, how do we do it right? <laughs> and secondly, uh, let's stay consistent in doing it right. So in the, in the study we're going to get our, that uh, kind of that comprehensive uh, look at um, at our transportation system. Are we going to have the uh, the shelter study in included in there? Are we going to yes. have that those yes. thresholds that uh, for ridership that really demand a shelter? We're going to have that as included in the study. Yes, All absolutely. Right. All right. All right. I'm I'm gonna. I, I think for the. Oh, we got. We have a. Okay. Um, what's the name of the current study? that we're doing the the, the service evaluation now, service. now and and Jim just wanted to make sure that we clarify that the shelter evaluation is a kind of an ongoing component so you've got the service evaluation and then you've got the the shelter piece sure uh, but again they all make up the yeah the, how do we look at our system right and I, and I think for for us it is it's good to know what those thresholds are right I, I think for yeah we you know, all of this is always ongoing. To be very fair, right? I mean, we're 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 always in a in a state of analysis with with all of these departments. But for some of these commodities, as you say, we, we at least up here be good to know what the threshold you all are are, are considering uh, where we need to be. So certainly, we'd we'll like to see that in the study. So, uh, listen, th th those most of my questions were answered already. Uh, you know, so I thank you for your time, Brian, and I, th I think we are we are done. Thank you. Thank you all. all right. Thank you. All right, and finally, we have the airports department. Right, airports department starts on B45. It is an enterprise department. Its total appropriations for next year are 35.6 million. The main sources of revenue for the, for the airports department are generated uh, from the fees from uh, Fresno Yosemite International Airport and Chandler Executive Airport. They also receive funding from Measure C and from federal grant funds. Intergovernmental revenues are increasing by 19% next year. This is composed primarily due to um, 
federal grant reimbursements for capital projects and a decrease uh, due to the completion of the uh, BAK capital project on the main runway. Expenditures for the uh, airport's department are increasing by 20 percent. They're increasing by um, 250,000 for the upgrade of the airport parking revenue system, which has surpassed its useful life and needs to be replaced. Capital appropriations are increasing by 5.6 million, and debt service appropriations are increasing by 37,800. The increases in capital appropriations are primarily due to the anticipated receipt of federal funding to continue the rehabilitation of the commercial aviation apron on the west side of FYI's concourse. The gap settlement is also funded. They will receive a transfer from the general fund of 839,000 in 2016. The full payoff, as I mentioned earlier, will come in FY17. Their only staffing impact is the conversion of a management analyst to an airport's marketing and public relations coordinator, which actually occurred during FY15. This conversion was intended to more accurately align the position title with the functions that it now performs. That concludes my airport presentation, and I believe that the airport director is available should you have any further questions. Councilmember Soria. A question regarding the, the gap settlement. So it is my understanding that it can't be pay, paid through enterprise funds. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. That, that's yes, correct. Yes, that's correct. Okay. So I'm just wondering in terms of how we um, delineate the, the funds that are going to pay um, for the settlement, for the settlement, I see that you guys included it as a transfer, and so um, just wondering why we included in the page 48 under the enterprise column versus the general fund, if it's coming from the general fund. Well, it's 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 placed in the enterprise fund because it's transferred from the general fund into the enterprise fund, and so as far as the airports is concerned, it's enterprise fund. Revenue. So it could never be included, or it can ne never be denoted as a. No, there. Yeah, it's it's not really. It, it isn't considered. This is not considered a general funded department. This is simply a bill that the general fund has to pay the enterprise department, and that's why it shows up under under the enterprise column, um, in that particular table. Yeah. Yeah, the other side, the other side of the transaction is is a transfer out of the general fund that is shown in the general fund. Yeah, I did. Well, okay. I'm just to make it easier. I guess it would just be. I know that you guys don't um, make a note of it, but I think um, I don't know if. Well, never mind. It's fine. I just wanted to ask that question. Sorry, to just for clarification, um, and I think. I think that was it. Thank you. Councilmember Capriolio. Thank you, uh, Kevin. Fantastic job once again. Really appreciate you and your team and the good things you do for. And I'm proud to say that the airport's located in the fourth district of the city of Fresno. So uh, fantastic. Keep up the good work. Uh, I like the way you analyze and have uh, come to some conclusions here. And I also uh, want to uh, congratulate you and commend you for the what it says here, FYI continues to host honor flights from the San Joaquin Valley. I think I've been there about every time they've come home from that flight, and it's, it's a moving, emotional situation for these World War II veterans. And uh, I'm so glad we're hosting that and will continue to do so. I, I believe uh, you will do that. Yeah, and thank you for the comments. In fact, the honor flight is once again coming back to our airport next week. And so we're excited about that, that event, and we anticipate uh, uh, great participation. Seems like there's a huge crowd, and uh, uh, it, it gives you chills to be there and see these uh, men and women that have served our country so long ago, and our, our original, at least World War II freedom fighters. And uh, it moves me every time, so I'll, I will be there again. So thanks again for all you do for the 4th District and the City of Fresno. Thank you. Councilmember Brand. 
Hi, Kevin. Um, the last time we, we spoke, the, I think you said that the, the actual number of flights in and out has is, is increased over the last two or three years. Is that correct? The number of flights actually has yeah, decreased mm -hmm. a little bit, but the number of seats in our market has increased substantially. So more the, people are using the airport. Well, a combination of two mm -hmm. things. One, larger aircraft are being utilized out of our market, mm -hmm. which is that we see that trend continuing into the next year, um, which brings more seats. Um, although sometimes they will reduce frequency and increase the seats and there'll be a status quo. And then, and then the load factor, the number of people on the planes is higher. It's up around 90% for our airport, um, higher than the average, although the average is pretty high nationwide. It's like 85 or so percent. And think about 90% full planes. It's more than full during summer times and holiday times. And and, and as you know, they're, they're, every seat is taken, and it's under 90%, obviously, during the, the off-season. So, so the combination of more people flying, filling the seats. Uh, in fact, uh, the added seats we've had in our markets during this last year, and one of the comments I get back from the airlines is, you know, sometimes we get nervous about changing aircraft to a larger aircraft, more seats, or adding, for example, this last year we got a third flight to Seattle. Now there's three a day. You know, that's a 50% increase in seats, and they usually see a drop in, in the load factor on the aircraft, but they didn't see that. In fact, I met with Alaska Airlines last week, and it's still, even with that third flight, 90% full, which is really unheard of in this business. So, so yeah, there are more people are flying. Every seat that the airline puts into our market, they're filling. Okay. I, I know back about three years ago, at the peak of that recession, a lot of airlines were really making dramatic cutbacks. Certain cities, like, like San Luis Obispo, lost their airport for a while. So that's been reversed. Any chance that we'll ever pick up like the, the direct flight to Honolulu or flights like that? You know, um, we're not seeing that on the horizon. Mm -hmm. um, what's happening in the industry is a constriction or a restriction. And so to say that airports are getting new flights to new destinations is just not happening. What is happening is if you're lucky, increase in seats. That said, I did also meet with SkyWest last week, mm -hmm. and SkyWest actually flies for four of the top five airlines in this country. They fly for American, Delta, United, and Alaska. Alaska is the fifth largest uh, behind uh, Southwest. Um, and under contract, they fly for these. They have the aircraft. They make a contract with these, the, the, the biggies, and, and they fly out of our markets, our size markets, into the, the LAXs and the Phoenixes and the Dallases and things like this. And not Dallas, that's mainline. Uh, what they have been shying away from over the last number of years is at-risk flying, meaning, you know, SkyWest will see, I think we can go from point A to point B, and they'll, make, they'll create a contract with an airline. SkyWest will take the risk on the flight. Is it going to work or not work, have enough people, et cetera, and then pay basically a fee to the airline to use their banner, to use their reservation system, and so forth. Um, the meeting I had with SkyWest uh, last week was very encouraging because they are seriously looking at, at uh, negotiating with some airlines to uh, reestablish Las Vegas. Remember, we had United going to Vegas four or five times a day, and they pulled out. Um, maybe not under the United banner, but another banner. Um, I talked to them about a Southern California destination. Um, they knew that we had the express jet going to uh, Long Beach, which was very, very successful. You know, um, but I kind of pushed uh, the Orange County destination myself because I thought there's a, a little deeper into Southern California, the population base in that area, um, plus the flights that are going out of Orange County. Is that John options. Wayne Airport? What's that? John Wayne Airport. John Wayne okay. Airport. So, you know, it was surprising to hear that they are now starting to look at kind of inter-California service, which they have not been for a few years. So we will continue to develop that relationship and see where it goes. The Las Vegas flight uh, on a SkyWest is uh, almost a no-brainer, uh, only because there's so much history behind that flight in terms of ridership. Now, the risk is fairly minimal for them to step up and do that. So those are the kind of things we're working on behind the scenes. Yeah, because... Uh they started in San Diego, right? A direct flight to San Diego? Alaska, yes. Right. And I, I know they used to have a flight directly to Orange County because I have my daughter lives there, so it'd be nice to get that 
re restore that service. Because if you get there now, you've got to go to the Phoenix or San Francisco first to then fly there. So it's pretty, uh, it's like an eight-hour counting the, the time and the runway and delays and stuff. You take a, actually take a slow bus and get there quicker. But uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, the, you know, the airport's really important because that's one of the first things that people see when they come to our town is that image they see at Fresno Airport. So, I mean, it, it looks a lot better than it did three or four years ago. Uh, keeping a lot of people in and out of that airport is good. The whole change, how they did the, uh, removed the uh, rental cars and so on. So thank you for doing a good job. Hopefully we'll continue to uh, add air service to Fresno. Thank you. All right, thanks, uh, Kevin. I'll wrap this up. Hey, really quickly, this is something I think Councilmember Caprioli and I talked about maybe last year, year before last, is that what we'd like to see for sure, there's a great uh, welcome message from the mayor in there, um, but I think we'd like to have a welcome message from the city council too, you know, complete with, with our photos in there. Um, so that when people are coming into the city, they know who we all are. Uh, and we have updated photos now to, to put in there along with the mayor. So uh, I don't think that's a prohibitive budget item. So hopefully we can get uh, a description of uh, the city council along with the mayor in there. And we can certainly do that. I mean, obviously, we have the overhead speakers. We also have our video wall, which is really a PSA opportunity. And so we absolutely can do that. And I can have, you know, I have my, my marketing folks can get in touch with, uh, you know, we can, you can have them with work with Councilmember Caprioli. Is that okay with you, Cap, to coordinate it for us cause, yeah. since you're in district? But I think that we talked about that maybe a year or so ago and just feel like we want to make sure that the, the decision makers in the city are represented there. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So that was a kind of an aesthetic thing. But uh, one substantive item I have is, um, and I want to join in uh, my colleague, uh, Caprioli, with, with saying how great of a job that we think the, you're doing with the airport. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Chandler Airport <clears throat> and kind of I know that we do some maintenance along uh, the south side of Kearney right there um, in between um, uh, up, down the west I think we do we're doing the the between Thorn and West right there along the that would be the the north side I'm wondering can we get both sides of the street done in that in that area you're talking about the landscape the, maintenance right kind uh, of pruning piece. the the oleanders and cleaning the area i'm wondering can we get both sides of the street done uh between thorn and west right there along kearney you know what and you know i, I would love to say yes but i think uh I, I think you know and a lot of us realize that the the the, the revenues that the airport uh, receives is is heavily firewalled by the faa and so we we are allowed to basically spend money that enhances and builds up the airport, but Chandler as well. Um, so when we look at the landscaping around the airport, if it's on airport property, absolutely no problem. Or if there's landscaping that is off airport property and it's, it's deemed to be a, a uh, safety issue for aviation, we can step in and trim or remove or do whatever we need to do. But if we were to spend money on, say, landscape uh, maintenance on the other side, then the FAA could say, so what are you doing? You know, you're not allowed to spend your revenue, those kinds of things. So. So it's a challenge from our end as well to extend it out that far. So we certainly do what we can do uh, within the environment of the airport. But um, I, I understand what you're saying. and appreciate the comments. But uh, sometimes all of our hands are tied. All right. Those wrap up, uh, wrap up my questions. So all right, go ahead, Kyle. Yeah. Very, very quickly, the international flight, the, the one to Guadalajara, I shouldn't say international, but the, uh, how's that going? It's going fantastic. In fact, also last week, I met with Valeris Airlines. Uh, the meeting I was at didn't have Aeromexico, but it had Valeris. And uh, they're very, very happy with the flight. In fact, they just recently reconfigured their aircraft to go from 174 seats to 179 seats. Last night, there was 184. A lot of lap kits. These flights are absolutely full. Um, they, their priority, and we talked to them about other destinations in Mexico. Not okay. so much the beach destinations. There isn't quite the, the volume of people wanting to go to the beach destinations, um, although they can transfer through Guadalajara, uh, but other destinations in Mexico. And they, they understood that. They know what their market is. But their focus is to put as many seats they can into the Guadalajara market. And, if they, and they are already planning on some additional flights later this year. In other words, two a night depending on bookings and, and, and time of year. So very happy, very excited. 
The only limitation on the number of flights at this point in time is the capacity of the Federal Inspection Station and the Customs and Border Protection staff in terms of the time it takes to process. And I say that because if a Valeros flight arrives um, uh, late and then an El Mexico flight arrives behind it a little early, you know, they, they'll keep the people on the plane, the second plane, until they can get enough process through the facility so you don't have lines backing out the door and so forth. It's just kind of one of the protocols that Customs has. So, so that's probably the biggest challenge for the, for the airlines is the capacity from the federal government side. Is there any chance that the feds will look at maybe making it a little bit bigger to, to accommodate the, the folks, the passengers? Well, it's, and it's not so much the f physical facilities, because it was designed to handle uh, 757 every 60 minutes. Okay. So it's bodies in It's the, the bodies. The employees. In fact, yeah, in fact, I was talking to uh, Reno Airport also last week, um, productive week. Um, they have three officers on staff and went to customs and says, you know, we need, people are waiting two hours. And uh, the response from customs was, well, why don't you, you, you give up your port of entry status so we don't have to pay your salaries and then you can pay for all of our bodies and we'll give you maybe five. So, they're, so they, you know, they're, every dollar they, opportunity they see to save, they're going to try and grab that opportunity because we know it's going, what? <laughs> we just want, we'll pay for two more but no, you got to keep paying for your three. So, so it's a challenge with the Customs and Border Protection. Um, we're fortunate. We have 11 officers. We actually had one added early this year. They have not approached us to pay for them. And the reason they added is because of the overtime. Okay. And so they reduced their overtime. So it was a net, mm -hmm. you know. Right. So okay. we feel fortunate to have that many. I would say on any given night we have five there and and, and the, really the processing times at our facility are very very good compared to most other port of entries. Is there any time during the year that that you have more of a demand uh, for those flights uh, than other times? Well, I would say that uh, it's like any other uh, t uh, airline. The, the holiday season, the summer season, is very busy uh, uh, in in and out of Mexico. Um, but on those flights, I mean. They are almost full every single night. So we don't see this kind of big uh, uh, ups and downs throughout the year. It's, it's 90, 95% full across the board. So a good problem to have. Yeah. So really, if there's any problem, it's the, the bodies of the feds being there. That's the only thing That's... holding back from just more flights. Okay. Yeah, their their staffing level. They're saying they can process a flight in 90 minutes, even though we had the facility. Have they given any consideration to maybe adding more bodies to the Fresno? Even if we went to Customs and Border Protection and we said, you know, we'll pay for another body, uh, they don't have the body. Okay. It would have to come from a San Francisco, and, and 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 coming out of San Francisco, they would never release a body out of San Francisco because their wait times. Yes. Are, yeah. Yeah, not oh. as good at not they're longer than ours by a lot. Yeah, so it's a it's a tug of war for them to balance those resources throughout this this area. The, okay. It's Sacramento, Oakland, San Francisco, Fresno, Reno, the kind of Northern California region is where they they serve out of. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. All right, that will, will conclude the staff presentations of budget hearings today. I want to open it up to the public. Were there any members of the public that would like to comment on any of uh, the budget hearings today. All right, come on down, George. George Hostetter, reporter with the Fresno Bee, and the, the, the Bee would like to suggest that the uh, planned closed session, closed door session on salary discussions regarding unrepresented employees should be held in open session. Um, it, it, comes, it came up during budget hearings, and it should be done in budget hearings. Uh, if it were going to be done in closed session, it should have been done before budget hearings began. But what it was initiated in an open budget hearing and should be done in open session. Thank you. All right. Are there any other members of the public that would like to comment? 
All right, seeing none, we will recess for our budget hearing today. We will uh, resume tomorrow at 8.30. Thank you.